I'd like to give a shout out to our newest sponsor, Solutions Today Supplemental Insurance. If you're a competitor in the cage, in the boxing ring, put your body on the line every time you compete, you can get cut, you can break a leg, a finger, who knows, put you out of work. It sucks. They'll provide you with 24-7, 365 days a year, supplemental insurance covering everything from hospital stays, fractures, outpatient surgery, recovery benefits, family plans, and more. They pay out in addition to all other insurance, including WSIB, employment insurance, and your work benefits. Qualification is easy. No medical tests or exam needed. No occupational restrictions and no income verification. Head on over to solutionstoday.ca and get coverage for you and your family. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank my sponsor, Rycor Countertops. They deal in custom countertops in quartz, corian, meganite, laminate, and butcher block. They also have custom kitchen cabinetry, closets, laundry rooms, and millwork. They're family-owned and operated for 18 years, knowledgeable and highly experienced staff, and friendly customer service. Head on over to 1069 Clark Road. Check out their showroom today. Okay, welcome to Studio 88. Today, my special guest, Robin Black. Yeah, uh, Studio 88. Finally got him in here. Uh, I know your schedule is like super bananas. Probably one of the most busy schedules I've ever, I've ever seen. It's been weird, yeah. You yeah, know, I've been your... traveling a lot, like a lot. And uh, like it, whatever you're doing changes. Like you weren't sitting in, in a podcast a year ago. No way. You know what I mean? No. All, everything changes. I wasn't traveling a lot a year ago, or not as much. Now I'm traveling all the time, and but I'm home for like probably four weeks in a row, which is the longest probably in a year. Mm-hmm. So it's good to be. Like, I know because when you text yeah. me, you were like, "Hey," and, and you were you were available. Yeah, and I it was like, surprised me too. Like, you're yeah. you're really available? Yeah. Like you're never available? Yeah. So it's I, nice. Yeah. So I jumped on yeah. it. Yeah. So it's that's nice. and that's uh, kind of like a, a a small introduction to the <laughs> December six shows. Right. And Robin yeah. will be uh, working the floor for us. Yes. Uh, so how many fights have you got? Right now we have, we're sitting at eleven, nice, uh, nice. and we just got Elias's fight today. Oh uh, yeah! So it should be yeah. we'll, by the we time can... we're done this podcast, it'll be uh, uh, Brazilian guy. Yep. Yeah. 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 Said yeah. Be. yeah. Elias, man, like I'm excited for him. I think it's also really cool that he wants to like the fight is the priority, not what broadcast, what channel, like live or wherever. Yeah. He wants to have a real fight. He wants to go in mm-hmm. and be a martial artist. That's really important. I think. Yeah, I think, yeah, um, and when he was on, I had him on a few weeks nice. ago. And um, he just said he was going back to his roots. Mm-hmm. Go back to yeah. what made him get to the show to begin with. Yeah. And I think he really needs that. And it showed a lot of intelligence. For sure. I mean, yeah. everybody, right? Like, what are you really doing? It's very easy, no matter what you do. Whether mm-hmm. you fight, whether you, you know, um, you sell cars, it doesn't matter. Like, are you trying to get more likes on Instagram, or mm-hmm. are you trying to be really good at the thing you do? You know, are you mm-hmm. trying to accomplish something important, or are you trying to make it look like you accomplish something important? Mm-hmm. And for somebody like Elias, um, having a real fight that's meaningful. That's that takes you right back to it. It's not about how many T-shirts you sell or like the Pert Plus sponsorship or none of that. You're going to fight a guy in a cage uh, mm. because you want to be in that cage fighting that guy. Mm. And and I mean, that's true of whatever it is we're doing. Mm. That's true of life. I mean, it's very easy right now to get tangled up in the idea of what are the optics of what I'm doing? Yeah. How many Instagram followers? will they, I mean, that sounds crazy to say, but if you were a 17 year old right now, you you have to think about that. Like, are you treat really trying to learn something, accomplish something, you know, uh, uh, change something? Are you trying to to do something real, or are you trying to live a few layers into the the appearance that you're doing something real? So for Elias to just go and say, "Get me a fight in Windsor, in Canada. It doesn't have to be broadcast in Japan. Mm-hmm. I just need a fight." That's yeah. important, I think. So, yeah, and, and Alex hit the nail on the head, I think. And he said to me, because um, when I first, when he first approached me and said, hey, you know, Elias is available and he wants to fight on the card. I was like, You're like, I don't have really? 20 grand. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> really? <laughs> like, okay. I'm like, he was like, I don't, like, I can't afford him. Like, yeah. there was, uh, there's just too many th- moving parts. Mm-hmm. And I was surprised. Not that I don't think I could set a good stage for him, because I think I can. Yeah. No, obviously not like the big shows, but on a regional yeah. level, for sure, I can, yeah, for sure. I can take care of him like a professional. Um, 
But he's Alex said he thinks it was because he was comfortable with all of us. Yeah. That's you know what I mean? For sure. Like yeah. he he knew yeah. that he comes into it. We we don't know him as the superstar. Yeah. That's right. We I managed him in his first few fights. I, I booked those fights for yeah. him. You know, you've uh, Alex has been involved with him. You've been involved with him. I've been involved with him. All those other fighters in the backstage, he knew those guys coming up. Mm -hmm. You know, the all of it. It'll feel... It, if he wants to be in there because he wants to be fighting because he wants to be fighting, this is the way to do it, for sure. Yeah. And it's perfect fit. I mean, you... you I don't know you all if you always necessarily see how people see you, but you're you're very stable and ultra reliable in the things you say you'll do. You do, and mm -hmm. everybody knows that consistently for a long time. So Elias wouldn't just take a fight somewhere because he needs a fight. It's like okay, it's Jamie's show with with real guys in a real place in Windsor. Oh, Alex is involved. Oh, Robin's commentating. All of a sudden, it starts to feel like home. Yeah, you know? and I think we're gonna see a different Elias. Mm -hmm. I think so. Listen, like. He he understands the deal. And I know that, you know, he has been examining his own performance and his own motivation and all those things. But, you know, it's not enough, in, again, in anything. I don't care what you do. <clears throat> you, you know, you do a podcast or, or you, you know, you make chairs or you buy and sell houses. Just showing up and doing the job isn't going to be enough at all. Mm -hmm. There's too many people who do everything. There's too many people who are fighters. There's too many people who do podcasts. There's too many people who have Etsy stores or commentate fighting or whatever. You have to be exceptional. You have to be. The goal isn't become a UFC fighter or, you know, try to to sell a few chairs or, or the goal is to be exceptional, to be great, to be special, to change people's opinion of something, to make your mark, to inspire somebody. That's the goal. Mm -hmm. And I don't think Elias feels like he was doing that when it came just to the fighting itself, mm -hmm. you know, Elias is a funny, charming, uh, lovable character who he's a guy who really can do anything. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's another thing, too. And most of us don't have that, mm -hmm. that, you know, there's a lot of fighters in the world who fight because if they don't, their families wouldn't have eaten, mm -hmm. you know, that that there was nothing else on earth they could do or they would ended up, you know, a drug addict or in jail if they didn't do it. Elias isn't like that. So for him to go fight for not fifty thousand dollars, I'm sure he was making forty, fifty thousand dollars easily, oh, easily, on, easily yeah. on those easily. last fights. Not to fight on a pay per view or something like that is because he's like, I want to be there. And, and there's there's always so much to learn everywhere, wherever mm -hmm. we are, whatever we're looking at. If you're paying attention, and if you're interested, and if you're thinking outside of the first layer of whatever you're watching, there's some life lesson there always, mm -hmm. like a hundred percent of the time. Yeah, because he seems like different. He seems different. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah. Sitting with him, even talking with him on the phone, texting with him, he's different. Yeah, there's something that's that's. I don't know if it's being, you know being let go from the UFC. Yeah, well, going so, to his head, going, whoa, this you know you you can be cut from something. Well, life changes, mm -hmm. you know, always. You know, I had a a job at a 24 hour a day television fighting channel and then one day that job just didn't exist they which just, is the best freaking thing that ever happened to you at the time it was terrifying yeah i was so it was called fight it still exists but they don't make uh, content the way that we did at the time we would sit and we would analyze fighting and talk about it and make mm -hmm. videos and break down things and do news and travel and interviews mm -hmm. and stuff it was like the food network but like fighting so it's like even for me so in retrospect. I love how, love how now, you say it without yeah, saying it. It's, it's true, right? Yeah, like it's yeah. just like you you turn on the Food Network. There's a show about cakes, and there's yeah. a show a show yeah. about how they to made do, a mistake. Like it, going yeah, on. well, I mean maybe, but once you make decisions, you can't regret them. Like mm. you just have to. You're on a new track, and you go down it. But at that time. Mm -hmm. So I was paid really well to do really good work and get better every day. The, the studio was like a nine-minute walk from my house, mm -hmm. just by fluke. Like, I lived in this apartment, and they moved the studio to nine minutes away from my house. John Ramdeen is one of my best friends ever. I love the people that I worked with. It was a great job. So I'm traveling. My wife was in a musical, and we were in San Diego. Yeah, yeah it was San Diego, which I'd never been to before. And I wake up in the morning and, and my phone, and it's three hours earlier there because it's on the West Coast. So it's like 7 a.m. And my phone's going. It's Ram Dean. And he's like, been great working with you. I got canned. I'm like, holy shit, John Ram Dean got fired. And then Bob, who's a good friend and, and a producer, is like, I got let go today. I'm going to miss you, brother. And I'm like, oh, and, I, and um, now I yell it out. I'm like, shit, people are getting fired at Fight Network. And so now I'm like, wait a second, am I getting fired? And I'm thinking, 
well, you know, I do the, you know, and you're trying to both be honest, but also, you know, look at the, the thing objectively. And I'm like, why would okay, they fire me? Well, yeah, I, I I think I do the job of three or four people. If the mm -hmm. goal is to make content people consume, I'm doing a lot of that. Uh, you know, and I'm thinking, well, I wouldn't fire me. <clears throat> I'm also at this time. So this is two and a half years ago. I'm also at this time really, really interested in how the world is changing, how digital, how important uh, Twitter and Instagram and YouTube and creating digital content. And we were doing a great job. We were killing it. We were one of the biggest in that space two and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. But you had to be capable of looking ahead and saying, this is going to be really important one day. We should double down on it. Mm -hmm. If you weren't doing that and you're not looking at the future in that way, you might be like, this isn't really important. Let's get rid of it. So I don't, mm -hmm. you know, you can't think about what other people are thinking. It's very difficult mm -hmm. and it can, and it's a rabbit hole that we all go down. But when you're busy wondering what your boss is thinking or your mm -hmm. wife is thinking, or, you, you know, the cop is thinking who pulled you over, like they're, 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 you're really, you're really going into some shit that is not helpful to the situation. So I'm not thinking about it. I, I I'm trying to keep my brain clear. My wife's nervous, but acting like she isn't. So I text the boss. And then he says, call me. And I'm like, okay, fuck. So I call him and he's like, yeah. So we cut, you know, the whole department. There's no, oh, we, you know, we're tearing down the studio. We're just not doing that. Mm -hmm. And then that day I just didn't have any income. And I didn't, uh, this thing that I had poured myself into for, I don't know, six, seven years. Ramdeen, I think was 11 years. Mm -hmm. I could have been more. I don't remember exactly. And I'm like, what am I going to do? And at that time, it's very difficult to look two and a half years into the future and, and say, holy shit, this I'll learn a million things. I'll grow in a million ways. I'll build my business it, it, to be larger and better and more successful, and more exciting, and I'll love it more. Uh, all you can think is, shit, I got no job. Uh, <laughs> and I don't know what to do. So Elias probably felt that. But and everybody has felt that in some way or another, like people are, you know, their girlfriend or their boyfriend that they've had for decades just suddenly says, actually, I haven't been happy for two years and, and I'm mm -hmm. leaving or like somebody, you, people who think they have very stable jobs. A lot of us make choices for, quote, stability. Those mm -hmm. jobs are not stable because you might have a contract or you might have, you know, 20 years higher uh, seniority or whatever, but the job gets sold. The mm -hmm. business gets sold or, you know, you're in the business of making socks, but suddenly there's digital socks and you don't need socks. <laughs> I mean, shit, nothing. So we all go through this. What the way that you handle it at its best, the way you should handle it is get really drunk or smoke a lot of weed or whatever that thing is like. It just let it go for mm -hmm. days, you know, and then fucking get back to work. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure Elias and, and it's easy to say days. What it probably more likely is, is weeks and then a slow kind of, you know, testing of your toe in certain ways. But you got to get on with it. You mm -hmm. got to get on with your life. Like you're not going to let your life end. You're not going to give up. You're not just going to say, well, I, I used to love doing podcasts or putting on fight shows or being a fighter or, or talking about yeah. fighting on TV or dating uh, beautiful women or working at the sock factory or whatever it's over so i guess i just give up like you're not going to give up so you've got to go back and really be real about it so mm -hmm. your first reaction will be well then i need to get a bigger job immediately and i'll fucking show them or i gotta get a hotter girl immediately or or a hotter husband or whatever whoever this is or uh, elias is like fine i'll sign with fucking one championship for double that so your reaction is to double down so you, you mm -hmm. uh, do you gamble ever yeah, I have. Bit. Yeah, so you yeah. you play in roulette and you put a fucking thousand. I like to bet on fights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like to I, bet on the yeah. fights of the guys that I know. I used to bet on fights, but uh, then and it started to change my perspective. And my perspective is my whole thing. Mm -hmm. It's like what I do and what I love, and so I stop. But but I get you. Like and and it depends on your feeling. But but so imagine you're playing roulette and you put a thousand dollars on black. And it comes up red. You're like, okay, if I put two thousand on black and it comes back, I'll get my money back. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll make money. That's your first reaction. Double down. And I've seen it with fighters. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the guy will be building up, building up, building up. He'll lose. And then he wants a tougher fighter, a bigger name. It's to, to roll it all out. And it's like, bring it back a little bit. What are we doing here? Like, mm -hmm. what are you trying to get the filthy taste out of your mouth of being cut by the UFC or losing your job or mm -hmm. your girlfriend leaving you or whatever uh, by, you know, or are you trying to grow and start again? And if because if you're trying to start again, there's a longer road, and that longer road may involve a small step back, might involve a small change, might involve 
admitting maybe there was some weakness that you had that you're going to have to do a little studying or a little training mm -hmm. to improve. And, and that, that analogy, like Elias and fighting in this, and fighting has an analogy for everything in your life. Like there's an analogy for literally martial arts. Ev martial yeah. arts. There's an analogy that from martial arts to anything in life and vice versa. Wow, that's cool. Do you remember when we first met? Do you remember at all how the how it all went down? Cuz I have you to thank for for like my so, starting out. So I know you literally uh just reached out to me. And it's it's funny. Uh, you reached out to me. I think you were putting on an amateur show. No. Or no, no, you were putting on that. Uh, yeah, was, I, I yeah the done, London show. You'd never done. I've never, never done a show yeah. ever. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so you should take. It, it is in people trust you, and then, and I th I've seen this before. My friend Rick was talking about you today. Elias wanting to. The, people do trust you. Even the guys that put on that first show, mm -hmm. those guys were heavy hitters that weren't fucking around. Yeah. To put on that show, they trusted you, yeah. and then you don't let them down. Yep. And really, that's your that's your secret. That's mm -hmm. what you're doing, right? And and I, you can't always put your finger on it. Why you trusted somebody? I have a tendency to be open minded and and stuff. But yeah, I mean, I remember you reaching out. And it was it was it Windsor or London? It was London. It was London. Yeah, it, it was, was London. London. And yeah, and I remember the process. And then that kind of that's another skill. And again, these are not gifts or attributes mm -hmm. these are things that develop through a, through a lifetime you make a few mistakes here mm -hmm. or you learn something from a mentor there or whatever but um you 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 pulled it off that thing was a success yeah, and also huge. fighting yeah. wasn't so a lot of people who aren't from around, around these parts don't realize like when when MMA was not legal here, mm -hmm. and then it was legal. And then all these assholes tried to like get in the business. They all and literally there were six guys walking around all uh, Southern Ontario, literally saying, "I'm going to be the next Dana White," mm -hmm. like you literally using those words, which is ridiculous. And most of them didn't know anything about fighting and mm -hmm. failed. You didn't know well. You had trained as a martial artist, but you didn't know anything about putting on shows, and you succeeded. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah, but it was my team. Yeah, but that's a skill too. You Finding know. a team is a skill. Yeah, it's like my Building podcast a team. guys, my video yeah. guys, That's my team. Like, I, I've been always smart enough to bring on the right guys. Mm -hmm. And it, and if you didn't give me that chance, though, like if you didn't message me, you could have told me to kick bricks. Yeah, but you didn't. Yeah, yeah. which is like, and I have to thank you. For yeah, you're welcome. Because because honestly, man, like, um, Alex, Woody, those two guys, like coming into yeah. my life, really, um, they are the game, man. Yeah, for sure. But like, again, so. The, yes, it's the team, mm -hmm. but being smart enough to know that you don't know mm -hmm. is is important. So people will look at something, and you have to have a, a, a low enough opinion of yourself in a good way mm -hmm. to not go, I can fucking pull this off, no problem, I got this. Mm -hmm. Right away you're in trouble. <laughs> but if you instead <laughs> yeah. say, okay, this looks very complex. Actually, yeah. I might have recommended Alex to you. You did. I did. That's yeah, because right. it, it was. Uh, That's uh, right. You said, "Hey, uh, you message you email me back," yeah. and you said, "Hey, yeah, I have a guy for you." Because I, what it was yeah. was I was looking for a matchmaker. That's right. And I had Googled at the time yeah. the best matchmakers in Canada. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where, yeah. The what best else way you to go? Do? Right. What year was this? Two thousand eight. Thirteen. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was two thousand thirteen. It's hard to, for me to put together them. You know. The, the amount of time. That's not that long ago when mm -hmm. you think six no. years is a long time, but yeah. also not, you know? Because I, I did a, a kickboxing a kickboxing show yeah. in a small gym and sold it out. Yeah. And then yeah. Uh, I was approached by some guys yeah. that said, hey, man, why don't you do professional MMA? And I'm like, how do you do that? Yeah. And they're like, well, I that's up to you. Exactly. <laughs> they go, we'll fund it. Yeah. You know, you do it. And you do it. And I'm like, yeah. okay, all yeah. right, let me look into it. Yeah. And then th I started the ball rolling. I started with Hayashi first. Yeah. Yeah. Which was which was a challenge. He was he was he the was biggest the commissioner. Challenge. He was uh, when I started the story. I was like MMA suddenly was legal, and then a bunch of people wanted to get into it. But there was a commissioner who was very very like hard a hard hardest not to crack the, hardest in the world. the world in the world in the entire was, world. He made it so expensive mm -hmm. and so difficult with so many rules and so many no's. No, you can't make that matchup. No, you can't do it. No. Uh, you must bring in these these uh, referees that cost X amount of dollars. Yeah. You got to put them in. It was so sixty grand. It would end up costing. So, uh, but yeah. So you you started with the hardest nut, and so that nut was meant to scare you away. I went to Toronto. Went on a business. I, he said, "Okay, come to my office. I want to talk to you about the show." I said, "Okay, cool." Yeah. Went to Toronto. Wore a suit. I didn't know how yeah. it was. I didn't yeah. know how it was going to be. Yeah. And uh, I I said, spoke to another promoter from Alaska. 
Fuck yeah, his name is a terrible name. Um, and he put on Alaska Fighting Championship. Yeah, he, he had like Rich series. Franklin. Well, yeah, like yeah. He was, uh, yeah, he did good things up there. Yeah, he, he did. did. He, and, and he said to me, uh, again, I just kind of reached out to different people and just asked, started asking questions. Hey, man, how about this? And one of the advice he gave, the advice he gave me was, uh, first advice, not everybody's going to be your friend. He goes, Jimmy, he goes, when you start this, people are going to flock to you. People mm-hmm. are going to come around you. People, All of a sudden, people are going to want to be around you. Not all of them are your friends. Mm. That was the first great thing he advice. said to me. And it was great. A hundred percent. thousand percent. It was great yeah. advice. Yeah. The second thing he said was the commission, do whatever they tell you. Mm-hmm. No matter what. Mm-hmm. They say jump, you say how high. And I was always a compliant guy anyways. I'm a I'm a people pleaser. So work within the system. Uh, yeah, I'll work with it. Yeah, can. whatever you yeah. want me to do, man, I'll make yeah. you happy. Yeah. If this makes you yeah. get it through, let's do it. Yeah, you know. Yeah. And if if we're all happy, if the audience is happy and the fighters are happy and the the organizers happy and the produce and you're happy and the um, the commissioner's happy, then then yeah. why aren't we doing this? This is great. So I I dro- did the two hour drive to Toronto. I worked the night before, mm-hmm. barely any sleep. Uh, I sat in his office, and that guy just. He pulled out all the mm-hmm. dirt, and it was like, "This is what it is. This is how much it's gonna cost. This is what you're into. Sponsors leave you all the time. This he yeah. he said everything negative. Yeah, of course. He goes, the show's minimum 100k. Yeah, and I said, and you're gonna lose money. And he goes, yeah. and you're not gonna make money. Yeah, it's impossible. It doesn't yeah. happen in this province unless you're the UFC. It doesn't yeah. happen. Yeah. Uh, Which I, he designed it that way. And he literally did design designed it. it that he way did design it that way to, um, you know, because it was so popular that if it wasn't prohibitively difficult mm-hmm. there would be 20 shows a month they couldn't do it mm-hmm. like they wouldn't be able to pull it off their com- their he didn't care whether or not it happened yeah. or not either. yeah he, he'd right? rather he, it didn't I mean, he was again it was yeah. more work for him right yeah for sure and uh so as i got smaller and smaller and smaller in this meeting completely deflated mm-hmm. dreams just went out the window I'm like this can't be this done. is no way it's gonna happen yeah. but the last thing he said to me he goes but if you could sell over two thousand tickets do it yeah and i just went yeah. Uh, okay, let me uh, uh, let me take that home. You know, yeah. I, I was like, I didn't even give an answer. I wasn't mm-hmm. uh, cocky. I was, I didn't even know mm-hmm. what to think. And then I took the, the drive home, and all I did was think, it was like, okay, man, a hundred grand is a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Can I even do this? I don't know. And I'm freaking. And I mean, you knew at the time yeah. who I was involved with. Yeah, yeah, the show, right? yeah. So it was a little bit. There was a lot of pressure on it, on all yeah. of us to make it fly. Yeah, if. And, it, and honestly, it was an out for me because mm-hmm. I almost thought, OK, maybe if I go back to them and say, it's going to be this much money, they're going to go let's, yeah. forget it. Yeah. So I went back to them and then I went back with what Hayashi had said to me. And I on a on a napkin inside Tim Hortons with mm-hmm. my one business. Partner, mm-hmm. I wrote every expense. Yeah. This is what we'll spend on this. Boom, 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 boom. It'll cost this much. And I go, what do you want to do? And he goes, what do you want to do? Let's do it. Yeah. I go, let's do it. Yeah. I go, let's do it. He goes, big risk, big reward. Yeah. And that's, but that's the point too. Like, whether you, re- you can't regret a decision. Uh, you also, once you make one, you are, you're in on it. I'm in. If it's I say, like decision. I said, like, yeah. if I say yeah. I'm doing it, yeah. I'm doing it. Yeah. Like, there's no, I can't turn. The, that's the problem with my brain. It turns, it goes, okay, you made a decision. You have to do it. Yeah. And you know. so I'm really into now, you know, I always analyze things. And, but, you start out when you analyze things, you, you look at the what, right? You did this, and then you did this, and then this one. Later, the longer you do that, you look at the how and the why. You know, the system. You look at, thank you. I, I do have to drive. So it's only, only one. three it's of only, these. It's only one. You only I took know. a little step. If we can hang out for a long time. The why, the how and the why, right? And and the and the the structure of it. So I find that interesting now, and I, I spend a lot of time trying to reverse engineer certain things. It's easy to go, well, that happened, and then we did this. But it's it's harder, but more valuable to look at the steps and then unpack it all. Like, you know, the number one thing that you did, and that anybody who sees something through to either completion or success or close enough that they keep learning and it's part of the process is the first thing you do is you deal with reality, mm-hmm. right? What's the reality? It That's the listing of every expense. That's mm-hmm. the listing of every challenge. This is real, right? 
A lot of people go, well, fucking do this thing. We're going to sell six, 8,000 tickets. It's going to be huge. We'll put that, you know, we'll get TSN involved in Canada. Yeah. We'll get on yeah. ESPN. They start talking crazy shit. And then and they ignore all the challenges. They mm-hmm. look at it and they just go, okay, well, you know, none of that's going to bother us because we're badasses. You look at the reality. The reality is this is heavy and intimidating and frightening and expensive. Mm-hmm. But looking deeply enough at the reality allows you to either go, what is, um, what's the key answer? Shit, if we can sell 2,000 tickets, if all this goes, if we work hard and we don't screw any all of this up, the selling of 2,000 tickets is our answer. Mm-hmm. Now, we have a, now we have a problem that we can solve. How do we sell 2,000 tickets? Mm-hmm. The, 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 it all just became simpler. Literally, our job is now, our job is to sell 2,000 tickets. And once you start breaking that down, well, how many people do we have? How many will a fighter sell? You call the people with experience. They go, a lot of fighters will tell you that they sell three, 400 tickets and they'll, they'll sell 16. Yeah. Okay, I better deal with that reality. Okay, mm-hmm. it's going to be less than they promised. Some of these fighters are going to fall through. You start looking at the realities out there. It's like, I want to be a commentator of fighting. Okay, well, nobody's ever heard of me. Okay, so what do I have to do? Well, there's a lot of things I'll have to do. I better actually become good enough that they give a shit or nothing else will matter. Nothing else will matter. So we have to become good enough of a promoter or good enough of a fighter or good enough at making our craft whiskey or whatever it is. Number one, we have to literally be of exceptional quality or it won't matter. Mm-hmm. Then we could be of exceptional quality. It still doesn't matter because nobody's ever heard of us. Nobody's ever bought our whiskey. Nobody mm-hmm. ever, has ever bought a ticket to our show. You just you lay out the reality. Now you see the problem. One, I better actually be a good promoter. Mm-hmm. And then your next step, you're like, okay, what am I not good at? Holy shit. Everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All yeah. of it. So now yeah. this is very common. People will literally think, like, go on Twitter and and – mention something about matching fights. You could do this with brain surgery. You could do it with mm-hmm. anything. People are like, I could do Sean Shelby's job. No, it's a complex job. Highly complex. The answer somebody might give you is, how hard could it be? The fact that you don't know what it is is because you know so little about it, you can't even imagine the challenges yeah. of the job. So if you can do that, and you did that, mm-hmm. instead you're like, Fuck, this is probably really hard. I don't know how hard it is, but I know that there are people who have dedicated a decade to getting good at it. I better see if I can enlist one of those people. That's the next step that you do. Is literally, you again, you admit the reality of it. I don't know anything about this thing, and it's probably really hard. The mistakes that a lot of other people made, they looked at it and they said... They thought they could do it. Yeah, well, I I literally would sit down. So at, at the same time, there were all these other people doing stuff and they would pop by Fight Network or someone would introduce them to me. And I'd say, so have you got some fights together? It's like, yeah, I called Shaw Franco. He's got eight or 10 guys. So I just have to match them. It's like, of course, Shaw, one of the pioneers of fighting, has young people that would like to fight. Mm-hmm. And he's been around long enough that he knows, although he goes, yeah, I got six or eight kids. He knows only two or three of them will actually come through. But you don't know that. Mm-hmm. And then they're like, yeah, so I called up Extreme Couture. They said they had five or six guys, so it's going to be no problem. It's like, you literally don't know anything about it. You're going mi- to attempt. How many fights did you try to match to get these 11? Mm-hmm. 16? You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, sometimes 20. Sometimes well, knock on wood, man. Ale- Alex and Woody. Yeah, right. Man. They've been, yeah. these guys are fucking They're pros, solid, man. but it's because it's a complex job mm-hmm. that has taken them a long time. They And you know how people get good at stuff? They make mistakes a bunch of times yep. first. So now the mistakes that are inevitable, they've already made them. They've already learned from them. They've mm-hmm. already, and that's what's honed them to be so good at what they do. Then they also know the variables that'll come up. Mm-hmm. They're gonna, we're gonna make Woody, Alex, Sean Shelby, any great matchmaker, they're like, we're gonna make 10 fights. Three of them are gonna fall through. They know that in advance. Mm-hmm. But if you're new, you're like, well, I got 10 fights. I guess I'm good. Like yeah. you don't. You and then fight day, just, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, all exactly. them start dropping off, and next thing you're down to two. And it happens. And again, that's true of anything. <clears throat> you know, if you if you make a, a craft whiskey, mm-hmm. you're the brand new guy. You never made whiskey before. You don't know. Say, 20 percent of the batches don't come out. Mm-hmm. You know, you learn that eventually. But if you're new, you just don't know all these things. That's. Mm-hmm. But the adventure to doing anything is going through and accepting the fact we're going to lose some money sometimes, we're going to have a setback, something is going to collapse, it's going to be terrifying and stressful, and people Mm -hmm. are going to go crazy, but we're all going to survive, 
We'll take care of anything yeah, we can we, so that people will trust us, that know that they're, we're reliable and trustworthy mm-hmm. and honest. Then we're going to move on. That's mm-hmm. life. Because I always come back. Yeah. We always come back to that. Yeah. Even though leading right up to a show, it's, I hate this fucking yeah. MMA. Last one I'm ever going to do. I hate MMA. Yeah, I don't want to do this ever again. I know. You go on vacation and all you think yeah. is MMA. And then the next thing you know, it's like, all right, when are we doing the next one? All right, I got the bait, date locked. I got the venue. We're good to go. Yeah. Then all of a sudden that ball just starts rolling again yep. because we just we get hooked. Yeah. I talk to a- these guys every day. Anything worth doing, anything worth doing that's rare and hard and stressful. Mm-hmm. I'm sure those people are going through it. I'm sure there are times where fucking Jay Z goes out on, on a tour and he's like, This is the last tour I'm ever doing. Mm-hmm. I'm never dealing with this again. Anything worth doing is is like that. Anything worth doing is painful and hard and you get old doing it. You see these guys who look like wartime presidents. They're like forty five years old and they look sixty five because they were working on hard shit yeah. but that's that's life it's worth doing i mean i don't judge anybody who's just you know their accomplishment this month is they got 19 series in on netflix and it's when i say that it sounds like i'm being you know sarcastic or judgmental it's your life mm-hmm. you can live it however you want but there's there's big value in taking big risks there's big value in like trying things and failing mm-hmm. you know there's big value in like pulling out your hair and having your family being stressed out, but knowing that it's worth it because you're doing, you're accomplishing something, you know, there's, there's, that's what life is about. Like that's what, and not everybody has to do that, but everybody should at least do it a little. Everyone should Mm -hmm. just do things that are scary and hard a little bit. That's why I started the podcast. Yeah. First time you were, how many have you done now? 16. 17 or 18. The first one was the first one was with uh, Maddie Haborka. Yeah. It was 16 minutes long. Yeah. Don't yeah. you haven't I, you I haven't listened. It, try not to listen to it for like 2 years. Even if you've listened to it once or twice, try not to listen to it for like uh, 2 years so you can go back and go, "Oh my god, I was terrible." Yeah, I this haven't the, the I haven't listened to it. Good. I've I've yeah. watched little tidbits of it. The only one I watched was the Steve Molitor yeah. one that I did the other yeah, day I just cuz looking was, forward to that. Was out. It was. Yeah. It was. Steve's fascinating. It was powerful, man. Yeah. It was. It was just a different a guy, just pouring his heart out. To yeah. Him, you know. Yeah. He's. Um, Billy Martin was yep. uh, my coach uh, through a lot of my fights. He was my cut man for the yeah. first yeah. couple shows. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I I turned you on to him. Yep. That's right. And uh, and so Billy's a great coach, and he's one of these guys who's like, you know, he he'll teach great skills, and he'll work you with like. He, it's shaping you in a direction around something you want to accomplish or something that's going to make you better. You know, there were certain things I did very well and he would encourage you to do more of that. And like, he's a great coach, but he's, but sometimes it isn't only that. Like he's mm. one of these guys and I don't know, I could never put my finger on it. I haven't seen him for a bit, but I always send him the odd message every few months or I'll throw something up on Facebook. Cause I'll think of him. He's one of these guys who somehow has the ability that you just want to make him happy. Mm-hmm. Like you want him to be proud of you. You want to do it for him. That's very rare. Like, uh, and so Steve worked with him for a couple of fights. So I got to be around Steve a little bit. And we'd both be working with Billy. And and um, I forget whose idea it was, but I got a hold of Mark Hominick, mm-hmm. and I think yeah, and Hordesky, and brought them in to spar with Steve, mm-hmm. which was really cool. Uh, Steve, of course, is a world champion and was sharp at the time, and still. Everybody and and of course won won all the the sparring rounds. If we're keeping score, that's not how sparring is supposed to work. But if they did, but everybody, including Steve, was shocked how good Mark was. Yeah, yeah. Like and Mark's a kickboxer and MMA fighter, and Steve was like, "That guy's really fucking good." I remember the yeah. first time I ever saw yeah. him shadow boxing. Yeah, me. I I'd stare at him for yeah for a, the hours. Blown away. I'd, Blown away. I'd train at eleven, mm-hmm. and then at twelve thirty he'd come in. And he'd warm up and I'd stick around through every one of his sessions. And and I was developing my specialized skill in analyzing movement in combat. And I would watch his, there would be days, day after day, I would just watch his feet. Mm-hmm. I would just watch his feet. Like I'd sit at the ring at foot height and I'd watch his feet. And it's, he's, he's, you know, him sharp was definitely... Uh, I was going to say the very best martial artist or combat athlete I've ever been around, certainly for any length of time where it was weeks and weeks and weeks. But I have also traveled with George St. Pierre studying him as he was yeah. working to fight this thing. So, fuck. I bet like, that was intense. Yes. So, he's – George will tell you, and and I think this is true of many people like this, George will tell you his life is boring because his life is boring. 
right? George will get up in the morning and he'll eat an expensive breakfast, which is, you know, he's made a lot of money and he doesn't spend it all his way of like, you know, treating himself. And he'll bring his team and they'll eat breakfast. And then he'll train. Then he'll have a very expensive lunch. Then if he has his way, he will have sex with either, you know, I don't know if he's uh, has a long term relationship right now or I don't know where he's at in his life. But uh, but he would if it were up to him, he would probably have sex in the afternoon, then a nap and then he will train and then he will eat an expensive dinner and perhaps he'll train again, then probably have sex again. And that's pretty much his whole life. Which, if you think about it, if you love martial living the, arts, living the dream. this sounds pretty yeah. fucking awesome, yeah. right? Sure it does. Uh, but it's also every day is exactly like the last day. Mm. Now, on the surface, but then you look at the the micro of what he is learning in those moments and, you know, the detail of uh, to be as we all try to achieve mastery in whatever we're trying to do you start being able to access pieces of information that you wouldn't have even understood five years ago as you continued down a, a route of learning things. So George is learning things about his body and the way he learns and his nervous system and all these things that, that will continue to fascinate him forever. But I love being around him, and I love he's just a, a wonderful person, and, and I learned a lot as a martial arts, but I think the most interesting or inspiring kind of... Uh, there was a th like a 30 minute piece. And again, this, this is the one that jumps out in my head the most. But there were many, many dozens and dozens of times where you're watching true greatness in not just in performance, but in process. He's brilliant at learning and, and figuring out ways to learn. But I'm watching him. We were in L.A. and he was at I, I forget the name of it, but it was like a high performance strength and conditioning place. And it's like all over the walls, just NFL players and, you know, like high level boxers and stuff. And this guy's got him doing these machines that that have complex movements built around movements he'll do that are also raising his athletic platform, his body's ability to be big and strong and fast, but to do it in specific environments. Um, and so at the very end, they've got like three boxes, just could be any three boxes in any fitness gym and he's got to jump on one and spring in such a way that it, it's a very you know people high level strength and conditioning people will get it but it, it's in such a way that it's the shortest possible millisecond that you can decelerate and accelerate off of it on one foot and change direction it's an agility or a, um, a directional change kind of exercise. And then when he s bounces onto another one, he does it again in a different way that's confusing for his body. So it's like just one jump, two jump to a third jump, and there's different movements inside, mm -hmm. and it's very, very complex and high level. All four of us in this room could kind of do it, but not in the way it's supposed to be done, where you're using your body and your nervous system and, mm -hmm. and your musculature in the same way. And George kind of did like a you know, a C minus at this. And he didn't get mad and he, it didn't weird him out. He just wouldn't leave until he had it at an A plus. He just wouldn't leave. Yeah. And he wasn't mad. <clears throat> he wasn't telling anybody off. He wasn't swearing or frustrated. It just wasn't possible for him. He just couldn't go until he had it. And it only took him 20 minutes. Would have taken the rest of us weeks. Three days. We, yeah, it would have taken weeks because <laughs> we'd have to build the ability yeah. to use this ability. And he had that ability. He just couldn't quite do it with the timing, which again, it's like you could get a hundred UFC fighters and only nine of them could do it at the time because mm -hmm. it's such a highly tuned sprinter kind of a, only, you know, maybe um, a running back, like a certain direct high level directional change kind of athlete. It's a nervous system skill, but he just wouldn't fucking go out. He just mm -hmm. wouldn't go like, and I was watching it and I'm watching him and I'm watching his brain. I'm seeing the little turning thing in there and he's just obsessing. It has to happen. And then I kind of look around and everybody around him has just sort of accepted that we're going to be here for a bit because they know him. That's how he is with everything. Mm -hmm. That's how he is with everything in life. That's why so if he sat down with somebody who was fucking trying to explain to him how taxes work, he would be the, the same way. That's just who he is. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't sound like much until you witness people live their life that way. Like you're, mm -hmm. and you're, you know, I, we, I was building a documentary on him with TSN. So I, I watched him live, you know, uh, and that's how he did everything. And that's how he lives his life. It, it's, it, if he finds joy when he finds a weakness, mm -hmm. because then he has something to obsess about until he can fix it. It's wild. It's wild.
I see. wish I was. I wish I could yeah. be like that. But it, we're n- he's the one in a million of the one in yeah. a million. But we can all be a little more like that. Yeah. Because he didn't wasn't born that way. Um, he just slowly became half a percent better at being that way mm-hmm. until he's what he is now. We're all some amount of that. Every single person listening or watching this is mm-hmm. some amount of that. And with effort, we can be a little more of that. That's how everything works, mm-hmm. right? And those are the things you watch when you watch this level of greatness. When you watch Steve Molitor's feet, Steve didn't come out of the womb dancing and fucking moving no. his feet like that. And he couldn't do that when he was 15 years old. He was really good, I'm sure, when he was 15, but he couldn't mm-hmm. move like that. So you're not just watching his feet, but you're trying to peel another layer. Like, don't just watch the performance. Try to reverse engineer the process. How the fuck did that guy get that good at that? Yeah. How is anybody a brain surgeon? Why can that guy uh, free climb for 18 hours straight when the rest of us would die? Like, w- look at if you look at high performance, it's a wonderful thing to marvel at its beauty. But the real power comes in going, I need to know how they did that. Mm-hmm. And the short answer is practice. But <laughs> because skill development is a science that we all understand. If you apply effort, you will have setbacks. You will develop feedback loops that help you be rewarded when it works Mm -hmm. and learn where it's it's not working. You refine the training or the practice of whatever it is. You find educated coaches or trainers or teachers who also give you um, feedback and you do something called deliberate practice, which is purpose. And over that's we know how to do this. Science Mm -hmm. understands how to do this. We can do this with anything. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's there, but you start to, to look at it. And then on a high level now, it's something called sort of it's a it's multi-dimensional, whereas that free climber could partly be that good because mm-hmm. he fucking learned to play piano. You'd be like, what? It's like, well, by learning and understanding the new language and moving his fingers and connecting it to thought and rhythm. And you're like, holy shit. The idea of how to get great at things is to practice it and learn many other things and then find connections through those things. Mm-hmm. And that's that's life. Podcasting has something in common with your day job and with prom- uh, being a promoter. Mm-hmm. It does. As you do each of those things, it will make you good at all of them. It'll make you a better father and it'll make you better yeah. communication. Yeah, everything. Yeah, where do you yeah. get uh, where do you get your hard work ethic from? Um my father is super driven. Um and it was I don't know. I mean, all things in all of us are a combination of genetics and environment, Mm -hmm. right? So um, learned and and innate or or whatever. And those things connect too. A certain amount of environmental things affect your genetics to some degree. But but my father was – so my grandfather has a grade two education. He passed away, but his uh, he could say he could spell one word in the whole world, and that was his name. And his name was Ed, <laughs> and he and he could write Ed, and that's it. That's what he knew. Wow. He grew up on a farm. It was his father's farm, and then he farmed it. He met my grandmother, who and his brother met my grandmother's sister because they were in the small town, and those two teenage boys were you know seventeen and sixteen, and those girls were fifteen and fourteen, and so they were gonna make get married. Mm-hmm. Like nobody lived there in the middle of Manitoba. He was a farmer and some and nobody in their family had an education. And my father went all the way through to a PhD while having wow. three children and working selling suits at the bay downtown Winnipeg while going to university. And he, that's just who I don't know how or why that is. I don't know. It's I think it's there's a certain amount of, you know, farming is extraordinarily like you have to have an extraordinary amount of drive because you get up at 6 a.m. and you'll go work that field until mm-hmm. 9 p.m. and then yeah. you'll eat a thousand, you know, uh, 3,800 calories and then you go to bed and you'll do that again until it's winter, right? Uh-huh. And so I think maybe he saw that, but also you go back only a couple generations back and we can all do this now. Um, I, I'd say it's five generations. Someone from France got on a fucking boat And they said, we'll give you free land in Canada if you Mm. go. And that guy who was like, yeah, I'll do that. That guy had to be pretty driven, Mm -hmm. right? You know, your great, 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 great grandfather who jumped on a boat in France to go, you know, across with no food and then cut your way from Ontario to to Manitoba. And when you get there and it's winter and Mm. you're like, we're going to live here. And they go, yep, 
let's live here. Let's build a house. And they're going to build a house. Like, that genetics, the guy who chose to do that is probably pretty fucking driven. And oh. his kids were, and his yeah. kids were, and his kids were. And my grandpa was, and my dad was driven, and he got an education. And when my when he got an education, he he was able to teach us. But he was very, very, very strict and uh, regimented. And the expectations were really high. Mm-hmm. Like, we all had to be, you know, A pluses at school. You say I, we, so you don't know yeah, my child? Two brothers. Okay. And my younger brother, who is a great guy, he kind of rebelled against it in, in some ways. Like, my older brother, we're all a little different. I get along with both of them. They don't hang out a great deal or chat a great deal. We're all a little bit different, but we're all a product of being driven very, very hard. Um, there's no question about it. But also, um, you were, you know, th- we were supported. So mm-hmm. I really wanted to do martial arts. I really, really wanted to. And by the time we were doing it, I was in grade six, so it's probably like 12. I t- t- trained a little bit before that in little pockets where I could, but w- I just kept pushing for it. And then they started driving me an hour and 45 minutes each direction three times a week, and both my parents worked, and they had two other kids at home. They would drive me at whatever, you know, 4 o'clock to Winnipeg and for me to train from 7 to 9 and then drive home because I, I was – obsessively driven to do it. They knew that it was a great benefit. I was kind of a rangy kid and uh, you're learning discipline and stuff like that. But so I also learned it in martial arts too. But it was, you know, there's the genetics of having father, uh, the father of your father's father's father all being hyper driven and then being encouraged to do something I really wanted to do. And then you're, you're learning martial arts where it's like you take that natural desire to accomplish the next thing. I want to get a yellow belt. Mm-hmm. How do I get a yellow belt? You learn the steps of doing it. You learn, oh, I got to learn this thing and then do that and then improve this. Okay, I've achieved the yellow belt. Now you have a new goal. Well, I want to get a green belt, you know? And so I think I learned it there as well. But, and and I think you either have to cultivate it or it'll atrophy like any muscle mm-hmm. or any kind of thing. You know, I think it's easy to, to kind of, uh, for it to slip. You have to keep it a part of you. Mm-hmm. And, um, but it's also the things you start to do well or the things you like about yourself it becomes easier to kind of encourage that. You listen, if you listen to podcasts or you watch things on YouTube or your training, you know, I get inspired by the jockos of the world and mm. these really driven people too. So, you know, it all kind of just continues itself. Mm. When you did the, when you went on the rock and roll journey, yeah, did you still do martial arts? I, tr- I kicked a lot. Like p- part of my, my um, musician. Like uh, David Lee man, Roth. Yeah. Throw the legs up real high, yep. jump and spay kicks yep. with a microphone so, in your hand. So part of my uh, – there's my friend Rick calling right now, but we're on the podcast. Rick said hello. Um, the uh, Yeah, I would – performing and kicking and flailing around exactly kind of like David Lee Roth was a part of the show. So I still moved my body a lot and stuff, but I didn't really study. I watched a lot of fights still. Mm-hmm. You know, I thought about it. I think honestly – well, uh, and I enjoyed – playing in a band and there's a lot like we were saying about sort of that multi-dimensional adding of you applying of different things you've learned to different different paradigms that you do and stuff um the things i learned fighting definitely matter now mm-hmm. learning to write a song now making breakdowns it's connected you know uh, shooting music videos and editing videos that i do now it's connected yeah uh, writing lyrics and writing the poetry around how i see fighting it's connected so it, mm-hmm. it does connect but but truthfully i think at that time you know, especially as I got into my 30s and we were out late every night, like you'd perform till midnight and then you'd party till four in the morning. Then you get up feeling like shit and then you jam yourself into a little van or a little small bus. and You go to the next place and you repeat it. After that, it happened long enough. I think I at that time, I thought that my years of doing martial arts was done. Mm-hmm. Like I just I never. If you told me I'd be sitting here talking to you about commentating fighting and, you know, and 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 being able to offer some expertise into martial arts, I wouldn't have believed that. I'd have been thrilled to hear it, but I wouldn't have believed that. I think at that time I thought this wasn't possible. I I was Mm -hmm. deep enough into a world that I was in. I I was stuck in a rut. I mean, we we did a lot of drugs and we we the lifestyle was really bad and food and sleep and all the important things were bad. So that, that added to it. Mm -hmm. But I think I was also caught in this idea that, you know, I said we were going to do this 
and I said we were going to succeed and we're going to be a huge band and I'm not giving up. And even when you change, you want to do something different. You have, you have a, a goal. You're seeing the world differently. Your passions and priorities change. Sometimes you stay with something too long, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and I think there was, there was a period where I kind of felt sort of trapped. Like I would have loved to do different things, but I'd come this far down the road, so I guess I'm a singer in a rock band now. But was it the rock band being like a team thing? That's part of it, yeah. Because yeah. everybody's got to do this. It has to be on the same mindset to, yeah. to advance, right? Yeah. And if you're I, not. I think I also felt, I did feel that I owed those guys, that I was their leader, right? Mm -hmm. I was the one who got us to this point where we were doing shows with people who loved what we did and we made records with big producers and we had music videos on television that although, and, and this is, some of it is retrospective, I understand this, and some I did at the time, that they were more talented than me they were better musicians than I was. I was the weak point when it came to the music. I could write some good lyrics and I had good ideas, but I didn't become a better musician. And mm -hmm. that was a weakness that in retrospect, I learned a ton from. But at that time, I felt somewhat, some amount of guilt that my contribution was will and drive and solving the problems and booking the shows and finding people mm. to work with us and all of the kind of promotery sort of behind the scenes stuff as well as being a great entertainer. Those were the things I offered, but I owed it to them because they were great musicians mm. to bring them. And so I kind of created that, that dynamic in my mind. And it's not true. You're all sharing everything and you're all a part of everything together. But I, I, when I started to train to fight, and then now <clears throat> when I analyze and commentate and do those things, the that period of I realized that I wasn't a great singer and I wasn't a musician on the level of the other ones. And what I did was I hid I hid from that. Mm -hmm. I ignored it and I pretended it wasn't true or I didn't pretend it was true. I knew it was true, but I pretended it wasn't that important because I had all these other things to offer. When I started to fight and I started to to do the things that I do now and I started to work in sharing things about martial arts with people and commentating and stuff, I did the opposite. If there was something I couldn't do, I learned how to do it. If there was something I was weak at, I tried to find the answer. And that's before marveling at watching George do that. That yeah. just became my reaction to it when I did the post-mortem of my band years. I looked at it and said, where was, where was, my, where was my failure? Where was my weakness? And I could bring it all the way back to, you should... Yes, you were not. You couldn't play guitar or piano very well, and you weren't that great of a singer. You should have dealt with that five years earlier, seven years earlier, or even two years earlier. It's mm -hmm. never too late to look and go, I have a weakness. That weakness is curable. They were fixable or improvable. I know how to improve skills. Practice, feedback, improvement, dedication, learning, analyzing the process. I know how to do it. Mm -hmm. I knew how to do it then. I went from knowing nothing about Taekwondo to being a black belt as a teenager. Like, I, I knew how to do it. I just didn't do it. So now I never make that mistake again. Mm -hmm. If there's something, if there's a weak point somewhere, exactly. I need to find it and I want to face it. Mm -hmm. I heard a, a karaoke story about you the other day. <laughs> from Alex? Woody. From Woody. Yeah. He uh, told me, he goes, we went out one time, one, one night after the bar, or after the fights at the bar. In, were doing in, Lund in Hamilton? No. Um, I don't remember where it was. Where it was? It was probably one of the, for the score yep. fighting series. Yeah. And uh, he goes, we went out. We had a couple of drinks. People were doing karaoke. We're having a blast. He goes, everyone went. He goes, I went up. I was hammered. I yeah. sung. He sung. This guy sung. He goes, and then Robin went up. And he goes, he fucking dude. He killed it. He blew it away. He goes, and nobody wanted to go yeah. up after you. Well, so you you, you ruined the night. Yeah. I can still do that. It's a lot easier in a karaoke setting where nobody's any good. And so if you, if I'm equally as mediocre a singer or a little better, because I'm going to pick a song that I'm good, the other areas around it, the things that I got good at, are all still existing. So mm -hmm. what, I, what I definitely was at the time was I was a really, really, really good front man. I was, and I was good at creating a party and leading a party and making people feel like something special was going on. And we knew this because years later, you'd come back to the same town and everyone was there with some other people. They said, you have to see this. Mm -hmm. And you could feel it. 
And I think that was partly why I didn't improve the weaknesses because I improved that. And some of it was conscious, but not conscious in a way of like, how do I become a great front man and make sure I control the audience? It was more like when I did certain things, the reaction was massive. And so that there was a natural feedback where that felt really good. So I did more of those things. Mm -hmm. I didn't even think about it at the time. So and you would and the, also the the further you took it, the more they reacted. And this made me realize a lot of the sort of the limits to things that we think are there are not real. Right. Even and I, I, I don't like to talk about politics at all, but the president of the United States or the prime minister of England, um, these are extreme personalities. Mm -hmm. Nobody would have ever believed they would be compelling or or be able to get people to decide to side with them because we had this limitation to what we thought was correct within that paradigm. It's like, if you're a politician, you have to talk in politician speak. Well, you know, uh, we have to uh, do what the voters like and we have to make sure that we get behind this idea and we get equality for all. And they just make up nonsensical speak. And so we have a limitation on it. It was the same thing with performers. By the time we were taking off half of our clothes and sucking down beer and having it come out of our mouth all over our body, but we were also in a mainstream kind of band at the mm -hmm. time, you realize these limitations of what you thought, these, these boxes that people had sort of created were not real. Mm -hmm. you know. And now, even when I look at, at martial arts or I look at, at my job, I watch people commentate on TV. I'm like, why are they all talking that way? When you see somebody on the news and they'll be like, hi, uh, uh, welcome. It's uh, Friday night news, 6 p.m. I am Robin Black here at the TSN desk. And, you know, and, and they talk that way. It's like, why are they doing that? They think they have to. What's funny is I, I was uh, Reed Duffy. Yeah. I was explaining yeah. him to others like yeah. a while back. I go, you know how you have a guy and he's on the mic and he goes, ladies and gentlemen, hi, my name. Yeah. I go, he talks like that all the that's time. That's actually who he is. Like, that's, yeah. who, that's him. Exactly. That's, that's not. Yeah. yeah. You would think it's a broadcaster's yeah. voice. Yeah, he's just authentic. But that's yeah. just what yeah. he, that's it's what he does. It's also why right? you can, you'll hear his sense of humor come into it as mm -hmm. well. Like, so you'll hear his natural sense of humor and his curiosity and stuff. So on first listen, you do think, yeah, that he's just, you know, the typical broadcaster. Mm -hmm. But as his personality comes in, you're like, oh, shit, that's just how that guy talks. But a lot of people don't do that. The the re One of the challenges that I face today with my job, and it's not a big thing it's just something you, that i become aware of and make sure that i figure out how this truth it's just you know it's a it's a factual truth so you figure out how to work with it is that you know nine out of ten shows big shows the ufc truthfully and one championship like big shows global shows truly believe that most fighters can just do commentary mm. now why is that so because the the box of their expectation is very very low so the fighters all, not all, but a lot of them, do commentary the same way. The people who hire them and even the audience and even the people who sort of comment on Twitter think that box is the way. That is how you do commentary. Um, most of it is really fairly just imitating Joe Rogan. Mm -hmm. And if you take go far enough back, what's happening is commentary was boring and repetitive. Mm -hmm. Just like Dan Rather on the news, everybody was imitating yeah. Dan Rather. Just like if you talk to any fucking NHL player, they'll say, "Well, you know, you gotta put a lot of pucks on the net, and uh, you know, there's no I in team, and uh, like they'll all talk the same." Comment commentary was that way. So Joe Rogan comes in. Joe is a comedian, a free thinker, uh, a, a, sort of a wild idea guy with a lot of personality, who's also a martial arts expert. So now you put Joe Rogan doing commentary, and it's fucking totally different. It's better. It's better, right? Yeah. It's better because – so it's better. It's more fun. It's more interesting. It's got more personality. You mm -hmm. connect to it. It's all of these things. So now you and I today can look at that and go, why was that better? Mm -hmm. Because it was different, one, and authentic, two. So – but what happened is – Instead of people going, Joe Rogan is a martial arts expert, a comedian, a free thinker, all these things. So he's very different and he's being himself. Let's imitate him. <laughs> That's the yeah. wrong response. The right response is, wait a second. Let's be different and authentically ourselves too. Mm -hmm. Let The answer 
to seeing why is Joe Rogan so good at commentary is not, well, he's good, let's comment, let's copy him. It's he's good because he's different. He's good because he didn't copy someone. He's good mm -hmm. because he didn't do it inside the box. And yet, nobody saw that. They just, human beings have like mirror neurons. They're a part of us. They're why we, when we, you know, when we're kids, we see people use a knife and a fork and we can use a knife and a fork. It's why we all speak the same language. We're all around. We all hear each other talk. We imitate our parents. So it's a part of our nervous system. It's called mirror neurons. Once upon a time, primates had a stick and they'd stick it down an ant hole. Mm -hmm. They'd pull it up and eat the ants. And all the other primates would look and go, shit, let's do that too. Right, so mm -hmm. it's our natural tendency to imitate people, but so now they all kind of sound like Joe Rogan, you know. I've even heard I've been working with people at times where some, guys will go to the ground and they'll turn to me and they'll say the partner I'd be working with, and and I would never want to to try to denigrate somebody that worked with because I've worked with great people. But I remember just one time this guy I was working with he goes, so Robin, why don't you talk about how much harder it is right now to uh, to get a submission with the sweat on the body. And I'm thinking, why the fuck would I talk about that? That's a Joe Roganism. Yeah. They're of the 100,000 possible things we could discuss right now. The reason it was interesting when Joe brought up that idea once upon a time, eight years ago, that sweat and blood would make it harder to, to do a submission was because we all went, holy shit, that's crazy. I would have never thought of that. You mean these guys, when they're sweaty, it's harder? Oh, wow, that's wild. Yeah. I never have to say that ever again. We all have heard that now. It's literally a, po a waste of, of two sentences yeah. for me to say that. Uh, that is not the one thing we could discuss now. We could talk about anything. What's he thinking? What's he feeling? How did he learn this? What's happening in his body? What's happening in the hemoglobin in his fucking blood? Why, what's his brain thinking? How did he, like, you know, what's, what's his emotion like right now? Can he breathe? Where are his hips? Why are his feet there? Should he his feet be so? There's fucking a hundred million things we could all talk about. The last thing, and yet, because Joe Rogan's so inspiring and compelling, and we have this natural desire to imitate because of our genetics and because mm -hmm. of our nervous system, we just now do it. So now every fighter can sound like Joe Rogan from 2014 or 2015 because they've heard it a lot. The audience is quite used to it. The producers and the people that that sort of hire these people, like, I found some kid. He's he's a two-time UFC fighter from France. He says he wants to commentate. Let's, let's hire him. Mm -hmm. Of course, he, if your expectations are so low that all we want somebody to say is, you know, he's going to manage that distance. Now he's going to land a leg, a few leg kicks. Oh, he took him down. He's going to pass his guard. Oh, rear naked choke. It's all over. Wow. If our expectations are we just need that, then of course anyone can do it. Mm -hmm. Of course they can. How did you meet Joe Rogan? Um, like, how did that hold? Yeah, because you've been on the show a whole yeah, bunch of times. Yeah, I, I it's like actually it. wild. Like, because now we're friends, friends. Like, I... Like, I text him, and, you know, he'll see a fight thing, and he'll, like, hey, bro, did you see that? I'm like, you know, I'll be, we'll be chatting. I fucking texting him when I was in Singapore. Uh, like, he fucking texted me from Italy when he was on vacation with his kids to tell me that it was bullshit that I got my Instagram page taken down by the UFC mm -hmm. and that he was going to go and tell his audience to follow me. Like, I mean, that guy's an amazing friend. Yeah, right? yeah, he helped you get back. Yeah, yeah, and he's done shit for me. Like, I've talked about a lot of it, and there's stuff that I just don't even think to talk about because it's done so much for me. But, but so, one day, I'm going to say maybe, maybe 2014 or 15, like, you know, and I had 4,000 Twitter followers, enough that you would see when somebody popped up and it's like, Joe Rogan followed you. I'm like, get the fuck out of here. Joe Rogan fucking followed me on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, sometime in the, in the weeks after that, there was a DM. And it's like, hey, man. And it was uh, it was Mamad Kaladov. Mamad Kaladov was, the at that time, was truly one of the great 185 pounders in the world and one of the great fighters not in the UFC. And he was like 20 and 0 or 20 and 1. And he fought in KSW in Poland. And I did a couple breakdowns of his. And it's, all of a sudden, Joe Rogan's in my DM, and he's like, hey, man, that guy's like got crazy skill. I'm like, get the fuck out of here. Joe Rogan's watching my shit. I can't even believe it. So I answered him. Yeah, well, you know. And then we chatted a little bit. And then, like, I don't know, in the next week or two, he's like, if you're ever in L.A., you, uh, you want to come on my podcast? Like, I, you know. 
never met him. And three yeah. weeks earlier, like I didn't know he'd yeah. ever heard of me. And now, I'll, and I'm like, and I'm looking at it and there was like, you know, there was a couple of things that I had to do and there were different people and different things I was working on. I'm like, there is something I could do in LA. Maybe I should fucking, when I do it, maybe I should try to do it in this chunk, right? So I'm looking at it. And I'm like, yeah, okay, like maybe August 13th. So I'm like, yeah, well, I might be there. And I haven't bought the ticket yet, but I got to go there. This is a perfect reason to go. So I'm like, uh, yeah, I might be there August 13th to August 16th. And then I go about my business, and it's my fucking birthday, August 10th. And uh, he's like, yeah, man, let's do it. August 14th, 2.30. Is it, are you good? I'm like, holy fuck, Joe Rogan. I'm going to be on Joe Rogan's fucking podcast. It's on my, my yeah. birthday. I'm sitting around with people having drinks on a patio. And I'm like, yeah, man, that's wicked. And then the very first time I met him, I walked into his old studio, shook his hand, and then I started talking to him. And he literally said to me uh, something along the lines of, oh, man, I, I try not to talk much until the podcast starts. And I'm just sitting there going, holy fuck, what do I do now? I'm just looking at him. I'm looking at Jamie. I'm looking at the place. Oh, and he, uh, Jamie goes, if you want anything from the kitchen, you can go in there. You know, the, the old one, he had like a red red curtain. Yep. Now it's purple. You open that red curtain and you go in there. There's a kitchen and you open this one cupboard and it's like every kind of weed you've ever seen in your life in giant jam jars. And then you open the fridge and there's all the booze that you've ever heard, you've ever imagined. Wow. And like it was mostly coffee, alcohol, and marijuana was in behind that red curtain. <laughs> and then we just chatted yeah. and we chatted for like I don't know three hours. Yeah. And uh, at the end of it. The next guy was coming in, a, a rapper of some kind. He was like, this guy's fucking crazy. And he's like, and we are still talking. And I told him about the time that I pissed my pants the night after I commentated the Sumo World Championships because I had fucking drank three bottles of, wi of vodka. with You You know that story. Yeah, yeah. Did my, and I told Joe about it. And, and then they started the next podcast and they were talking about it after. The guy's like, that guy pissed his pants partying with sumo wrestlers. But so, and at that time, I'd never heard of, of um, Uber. And I go, oh, I got to grab a cab. What's the address here again? Joe goes, just use Uber, man. And I'm like, literally? I'm like, man, I don't even know my password to fuck? my phone. It was an Uber. He's like, let me get it for you. So he gets me to Uber. And he goes, take my number. And I'm just like, really? Yeah. So that, and I left, and it was awesome. And like, you know, all of a sudden, you know, fucking millions of people follow Joe as well they should. So all of a sudden, a lot of people knew my stuff, and it was really a big deal. And then he shared other stuff of mine. So like maybe a year later, I um, maybe about a year later at the same twenty four hour um, food network of fighting that I was working at, uh, I was in there like I was building and the audience was building and my value was building and and I was being logical, but I'm like ta talking to them about the job and pay and stuff. And they just, and at that time, they're just doing their job, right? Um, executives are doing their job, keeping costs low and whatever they want to do. And I'm frustrated. And I literally texted and I'm just like, I don't know what to do. And I think I got into a bit of a fight with one of them. And I thought, man, I, like, I hope I'm fucked this up. And I just thought, I'm going to text Joe Rogan. And I texted Joe Rogan. Hadn't talked to him since the podcast. And I said, hey man, um, you got a minute, I can ask your advice. And like 30 seconds later, my phone rang. It's mm -hmm. like, hey, man, what's going on? And it's fucking Joe, Joe Rogan phoned me. Yeah. And I told him what was up. And he goes, man, does Dana, do you know Dana? I said, I think I interviewed him once, but I don't think he knows me. He goes, hmm. Can you like send me like four or five of your best things? Just send it in my email. This is my email. Send it in there. I'm like, okay. So I sent him like a couple of, you know, Conor McGregor breakdown and a couple of the ones I was doing at that time there. And like within 20 minutes, he texts me. He goes, I sent Dana your stuff. He's freaking out. He asked for your phone number. So I gave it to him. Mm -hmm. I'm like, wow, man, thanks. And then on Monday, the vice president of the UFC calls me and he goes, hey, you know, uh, we're thinking this would be a really good time to bring you on. Are you going to be in Vegas or L.A. to have a meeting with us? And I'm just like, what the fuck? Like Friday, I was like stressed <laughs> yeah. out about my regular te uh, Canadian television job. And I talked to Joe Rogan for two minutes. And on Monday, uh, which even saying I talked to Joe Rogan for two minutes sounded weird when I said it out loud at the time. Yeah. And on Monday, like I'm going to, to Vegas to uh, meet with Dana White and like some executives at the UFC. So like a, a week or two later, I go down there and uh I, I come in and we're chatting about, you know, 
background and you know they didn't know that I had fought and different things about, about how and why I do what I do. Dana walks in and then he goes, you know, I got something for you. You know, I know Ronda's going to kill Holly Holm, but like, you know, and Joe Rogan's already told everyone that. So, so I need somebody to be able to show the other side. Like if and I said, I don't know, man, I think Holly might kick her in the head. And he's like, really? And, and Dana White and I are standing up and we're like acting it out in his office, like, you know, walking around, like <laughs> throwing amazing. kicks at him. And he's like, man, we like your passion. He goes, listen, this is what we're going to do. We're going to move you and your wife to L.A. And um, uh, you're going to be on uh, UFC Tonight, which was on Fox at the time, every Monday or Wednesday, whatever it was. We're going to use you in our pre and our post shows for your breakdowns. Uh, welcome aboard. And so the other guy, the, the, other, the vice president, says, listen, you'll have a contract from us within four days. And then uh, he says, hey, you know, make sure he meets Lorenzo. I want to make sure Robin meets Lorenzo. Hey, listen, you got a lot of passion. We need more people like you with passion. You see the game differently. And I go out and I meet Lorenzo and shake his hand. He goes, this is Robin. He's going to be an important, uh, you know, uh, on air for us. He's an analyst. Oh, well, great to meet you. And I left. I proceeded to drink tequila, call all my friends, be like, holy shit, you're not going to believe this, man. Like, I'm fucking going to be on all the UFC pre and post shows. This thing's done. And then I, just before I was going to the airport, I took $50 and I put it on Black 10. Um, Black is my last name and August 10th is my birthday. And it hit. And I went $2,750 on the spot. And I'm like, holy fuck, my whole life has changed. <laughs> I go to the airport and I go home. And then I keep my phone near me for like, I'm taking a shower and I've got my phone near just for waiting for that phone call for the thing, you know. And I'm like peeking outside the shower and I keep my phone ringing. And, uh, I was supposed to receive the contract in four days, and that was four and a half years ago. Uh, still no contract. So, oh. Yeah, <laughs> still no contract. Uh. Yeah, it's just the uh, – I didn't – again, these are the things you don't know, right? Mm -hmm. When you go to book ten fights, you now know two or three of them might go. Mm -hmm. New guys think, oh, I got ten fights. I got a show. I'm going to be the next – I didn't know that when people make those kinds of things, that it's when they do or other large businesses with a lot of excitement, those things actually don't mean that's a thing. Mm -hmm. What they mean is, we're trying to work on this, maybe we should, oh wait, there's another colorful light that has distracted me and then shit changes. Yeah. So really, what ended up happening was I did um, about seven or, you know, I start emailing five days later because I'm like, well, they said four days. I want to like act like I'm too... You know, mm -hmm. too weird about this. But so at five days, I start emailing. Around eight days, I get a phone call. They're like, well, listen, you know, just what we were planning to do was take the um, what would be your your fees from doing those shows from Fox and then bring you in as a UFC employee and offset your your contract with those fees, which is normal. Right. Mm -hmm. That's a very common thing. It's like we would find a way to have you work for us. But then sublease you and basically pay for ourselves. So what we would have is you, mm -hmm. you'd be thrilled working for us and they would get what they get and we'd all be thrilled. They said, unfortunately, the guy at whatever, the vice president of content or, or of, you know, talent or whatever. Unfortunately, two days after that, that guy who was my big champion, before they called me, they sent it to him and he was like, I love this guy, bring him in. He got let go two days later. So, all, and you don't know that at that time when you're, you know, drinking tequila, calling all your friends, holy shit. It's like when you're a little kid and you think you're going to get signed to Sony Music or, you know, you're, you're um, an 18 year old fighter and you just got the call to fight for the UFC. It's the same thing to me, right? But I didn't realize that that isn't face value. It's not a done deal when you shake Lorenzo's hand. It means we're trying to do this. Oh, wait. It something changed that just cost us two hundred thousand dollars to try to do this. So let's just wait. So instead, I did a bunch of small projects for them that had no contract that literally were just projects for them and some commentary for Fight Pass. Mm -hmm. And then they got sold to whatever IMG, whatever it was called. And whatever work I did through the guy I worked, he was gone. And so now you were just sitting there emailing people going, hey, remember me? Remember uh, I was supposed to come and work on And now they're on a different network. And so those things just kind of mm -hmm. fizzle and Peter. Nobody, and I've told people about this before, like um, 
you know, friends at work and Audie, who is Conor McGregor's manager, and people, hey, you know, you have a Chael, who's a good friend. I'm like, Chael, what should I do? And they're like, these things are not somebody's fault. They're not trying to fuck you. They're not saying, let's make Robin Black think his whole life has yeah. changed and he's moving to L.A. and then pull the... They're just trying to do business and business is complicated and it doesn't end up working out. And so, but each of these setbacks, you know, the next number of months is incredibly stressful. I'm in L.A. for different things and I'm like, am I moving here? Should I be looking at apartments? Mm -hmm. Like, I, oh, wait, they moved to ESPN. Well, do the people at ESPN know it? Like, the whole thing, it, it, they're just layers and layers of business. And business, which is, it takes you a long time to learn this as well. Business is an organization. Mm -hmm. Like, say some, you know, say Nike or the NFL or the UFC. Somebody's like, yeah, the UFC didn't want to, you know, do XYZ deal. The UFC isn't a, a machine with a bunch of little gremlins and goblins in there turning. Mm. The UFC is a whole bunch of regular people that all together try to figure out how to do things. They're complex organizations of people. They're just humans. Mm -hmm. There's groups of I, humans. Hayashi said that to me one time. He goes, you know, hey, Jamie, you know what the difference between you and the UFC is? And I said, what? He goes, he's got like 300 people working for him. Yeah, that's right. And I was that's like, exactly oh, right. Cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. Yeah, it know? does. And those 300 people don't all see eye to eye. They mm -hmm. don't all agree on everything. There's not a, they don't all have the same goals. They don't all have the same plans. They're not, some structures work better than others. And uh, it is, those are the things. But you each, again, now I know that that experience made me way better. Mm -hmm. I also know now that as I do look at these things and think, you know, all the commentary sounds very similar. Whether people realize it or not, it's be if, if they still are in that box, they don't, they don't know mm -hmm. that. Or all of the way we examine things are very similar. Or there are limitations. We're stuck in boxes of how we do things. I'm not in that box. Um, I'm exploring things in the way I want and making a great living doing it in my own way. That's made me grow mm -hmm. as a person. So it's good that happened. It's good those things worked out the way they worked out. Because if they didn't, and instead, you don't know how that fork in the road goes. Instead, you're on UFC tonight, and somebody's saying, actually, don't say bink, you know, and that whole flim flam and enjoy the hostilities. I don't want you saying that. You know, the audience I, is going to like it. I was going to say, yeah. because I like that you're kind of free. I like I that. Do too. I, I like yeah. that, you know, you, you catch you on Bellator. You yeah. Catch you on Left Wing. Yeah. You can see you over. I, I actually really like. You're more unique and more authentic. Yeah. The fact that you can just go, yeah, I'm gonna go over here, and all yeah. of a sudden I get the luxury to have you in December. Yeah. Then yeah. you know, then after that, your next project. I don't, I don't think you're meant to be held down. Yeah, it's. I know that now, mm -hmm. but at the time, you know, it's like now you you really have to, you really have to be willing to understand that dreams, like, and I put those in quote, or goals can and should change mm -hmm. and that the ones you have may not be right for the long term at that time my dream or my goal was to commentate the ufc mm -hmm. in retrospect that would have been a it would have been a very limiting thing because what that really is is i want to be employed by a particular company that's what that is that's not a very logical dream or goal Mm -hmm. Because you don't even know what that company is. You don't know how they work. You don't know what their beliefs are. Mm -hmm. You don't know what their structures are. You don't know how long they'll be around or how they'll grow or how they'll change or one what your relationships within it will be. The goal of working for Nike or McDonald's or the UFC or the NFL, it's a weird goal. In retrospect, it's not a logical goal. Um, and But had I done that, I would have been in this umbrella. Now, And there are pluses and minuses. So you're talking about left way. I'm, um, I was in... Myanmar mm -hmm. commentating it. I'll tell you about it. It's amazing. But this is this is the thing that I kind of noticed related to that. So I'm over there for a week and it was fucking inspiring and beautiful and life changing and heavy from a martial arts standpoint, from a seeing one of the poorest parts of the world with the happiest people and most mm -hmm. loving people you've ever met, all of these different things. And I can tell you about any part of that, too. But at the end of it, it's time to go home. And I just, you know, la let's say last night. Today I'm going home from Myanmar. Last night I sat beside a ring and commentated a thousand-year-old bare-knuckle martial Burmese martial art with headbutts with the best guy in history, Dave, who mm -hmm. has become a friend. Who's Canadian. Yes, yeah, Canadian also. Yeah, fighting right in front of me at, uh, against a, a, a real opponent. 
as I'm taking the whole thing in and feeling it and living it. And they're playing, you know, a thousand year old song on instruments I've never seen in my life in an orchestra pit with dragons and gold and shit all over it. And it blows my mind around wonderful people. The next day I begin my journey home. It's 38 hours. I'm going to, uh, I'm still on that first day, yeah, which it's, means it's... I'm going to be able to drive home, but I will have another. Yeah, it's not good. So I'm beginning my 38 hour journey home. Uh, after a wonderful life-changing trip. And uh, it is a flight from Mandalay that is somehow four hours to get to Yangon. And Yangon is the capital of Myanmar. So I'm in Mandalay Airport, and they say your flight is delayed five hours. It's like it's the beginning of my 38-hour journey. It's already been delayed five hours. But because I had a 10-hour delay on the other side, I'm going to make my flight. I get up on that flight. And it's got three stops. The flight. It's a domestic flight. There's fucking chickens on the plane. Wow. Right? And I'm the only guy outside of that country that's, you know, like there was a, a guy who I met who spoke really good English, and he's from Japan, and he was involved with the show. It's also weird. When I arrive, they're like, look, a white guy, an American or whatever. When I leave, everybody wanted a picture with me because I commentated their Super Bowl. Yeah. Like, it's their national how sport. Many, how many people are in the stadium? Um, thousand, three to four thousand, I think. Really old, beautiful stadium. People selling like lemonade outside. It was amazing. So now, uh, uh, three stops, and uh, getting there, that it had no stops. So I almost got off on the first stop. <laughs> and if I got off, I'd be in fucking some city. Like I wouldn't know, and maybe nobody spoke English. So suddenly, I'm cluing in. Like, I better be a little more alert here. Like, so mm. three stops. And when I get there, I have to go from the domestic terminal to the international terminal. Now, that's one kilometer. And it, sa it says it's one kilometer on whatever fucking Google Maps says. It's got to have been two or three kilometers. It felt like 30. And as I take my Western plastic suitcase with the little plastic wheels and pull it down, immediately I'm like, what the fuck am I doing? It's like the, the movie MASH or the TV show MASH. It's like the, the road has cars going in both directions. and at, All they're driving there was like that. I have so many things I could tell you about. It was so amazing. <laughs> and there's just like six cars wide going one way and six cars <clears throat> wide going the other and some crossing over. There's no sidewalk. There's plants and stuff. There's live wires. There's like wild dogs. Like I'm not fucking shitting you. Like I'm full on like, right, I'm in Southeast Asia at a domestic airport so it doesn't have international money. It's like, holy shit. Now I'm being stung by mosquitoes and it's like 34 degrees Celsius. Like it's hot, <laughs> hot. I'm soaking wet. And those mosquitoes, I didn't get no shots. I just wanted to commentate some fights. They got malaria in them and shit. Yeah. And I've got hundreds of them all over my face, sweating like a pig. My suitcase is breaking. Live wires, wild dogs, cars. And I get to the airport. And I'm like panting and I'm soaking and I go and there's Wi-Fi there. It's the international airport. So it's a little more connected to the rest of the world. And I, I'm, I'm Skyping my wife and she's looking and I've got that one wet nap that I saved from the airport. And she's looking at me like, holy shit, are you OK? And I got welts and probably malaria it just hasn't hit me yet. It's terrifying. And I got five hours there and I'm like, OK, holy fuck. Like, so this is the trip like it. This was worth it. I would do it again in a second. If they wanted me to go do the Cambodia, the, the uh, Letway in Cambodia in January, I would do it in a second. Um, but I'm sitting there, five hours. Then I get on another plane. I go to Hong Kong. And in Hong Kong, it was like 48 hours before they shut down the Hong Kong airport. So there's like military around and people protesting and shit. Mm -hmm. And I'm in there. And now I got another seven or eight hours before my 16-hour flight back. And I'm, I'm beat. And I just... You know, get Wi-Fi and I open stuff up. And my friend, um, uh, it's just, it's just Laura. So Laura, Laura Sanko is her name. She works, she does UFC stuff for Fox. Blonde, she does some um, contender series stuff. Very mm -hmm. good. Very, very good. And I really like her. And I like, like, she's an awesome person. At the same time, as... I was sort of brought on to the UFC and they said, you're going to do X, Y, and Z. She was also brought on. So this is five years ago or whatever. <clears throat> she and her and I had conversations about it in those early years. She's like, you know, I, I don't know. Like, I haven't got a lot of chances yet. But she did, quote, the right thing. She was hyper patient. 
She'd sent, she had, she had a better understanding of what emails to send to people, how to develop the relationship just right with whatever producers you've got to smooth, smooth over just correctly. I didn't. I eventually was like, look, man, if you're not going to fucking give me some work, like I get it. I got to move on, you know, and that's in line with me being authentic. That's in line with it started to feel wrong to be sitting there not having a job and just sending emails trying to kiss the ass of a particular producer or, or executive. Mm -hmm. Not that there's, with no judgment, anyone can live their life their way. It just didn't feel right to me. Mm -hmm. I had to go find work in China and Russia and, and South Korea, and that's what I was doing. She did, the, the, did it the, quote, correct way. So now she is working for them, in a, and she's doing a great job, and she's very good. But I opened my, my um, tablet, and I look, and she's sitting in Dana White's office doing a, a piece. Uh, and it's really honestly, uh, and it's, you know, this isn't to purposely fully be critical. It's just what it is. It was a hit piece on Cyborg mm -hmm. because Dana had fucking had enough with Cyborg. And so it was, Laura was there sort of set up to offer Dana so softballs that he could be like, you know, she did this wrong and I can't believe she did this. And basically, mm -hmm. you know, and that's not, I'm not trying to, be a dick about it. It's like, we're all just humans. Dana White's just a driven businessman who loves what he does in his own way and he loves to win. And he doesn't like to be fucked with. And mm -hmm. Cyborg fucked with him. So he was gonna fucking let her have it. But I'm looking at him like, Laura is sitting in his office doing this piece that on some level might make you uncomfortable. It would make me uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. That's basically trying to character hit of somebody that's moving away from the business. And there's lots of reasons to do that, and that's no judgment on Dana. But he might have also done it because he's an emotional human being. We're mm -hmm. all humans. We're all just, sometimes we get mad, right? But she's got to sit there and lob these in. So tell us about what happened with the relationship with Cyborg. Whereas I was sitting beside a ring with a thousand-year-old martial art talking in depth with the joy and cherishing the moments of combat between these brilliant artists. Yeah. And it's like, and I thought about it, like because I had nothing but time. I'm like... She's probably making more money to do that. And it was probably what, an hour and a half flight. And mm -hmm. she'll be home with her husband and her son. And, and you know, it'll be comfortable. It'll be, she'll be in a comfortable environment, pay, uh, paid well to do a job that she can be proud of, that she's very good at. Mm -hmm. I'm going to travel 38 hours. Maybe I got malaria. But, I, but both of us are where we should be. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I, I looked at that. I'm like... Do I wish that I was part of that machine, making sure I helped their controlled message that they believe well in? They're not monsters. They're mm -hmm. not a. They're not a Death Star. They're just people who believe in what they believe. Would I rather be part of that machine, saying the things I gotta say about striker versus grappler in a stylistic matchup on Saturday night in one of the biggest fights ever, with you know the winner gets a title shot? Would I rather be doing that, or would I rather be sitting there like looking at mm -hmm. the history and the beauty and like the complexity of the? And the answer is, I'd rather be fucking getting stung by mosquitoes yeah. traveling around the world. Yeah, doing you're that. a true martial artist. That's why. At, at, it's at the root of it. It's at mm -hmm. the root of what. Yeah, I'm motivated by what I'm motivated by. And I'm also getting older. Like, I don't got time for that shit anymore. And would, does that mean that there aren't times where I'd be like, listen, you have to learn these lessons. There are going to be times where you have to just, for the greater good of accomplishing something meaningful, you have to kiss the right ass or you have to phrase the right email or you have to hesitate from expressing your opinion about something that you believe is wrong or whatever. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm willing to do that on occasion, but I don't got time for it um, because we also live in a world now where a lot of those machines aren't necessary anymore. Mm -hmm. I can make a video analyzing martial arts that 150, 250,000 people will see. Half a billion people have watched my videos in the last two years. Half mm -hmm. a fucking 500 million. Jeez. So <laughs> I don't need that machine anymore. So as, and I've also learned this from Joe, who, Rogan, who, yes, he does work in that machine, but the only way he's doing it is nobody's fucking telling him what to say mm -hmm. or how to do it. And the only conflicts that I've seen that he's ever had, and he's talked about them, I don't think I'm talking out of turn, was when fucking executives at Fox were in his ear telling him, hey, hey, you know, you're yelling. And he's like, who the fuck is this guy? Some, some producer named 
Trevor or Steve that mm-hmm. like he's never heard of who came over from fucking basketball. He's fucking Joe Rogan. Like this is how the audience consumes it. Who the fuck are you to tell this guy? But he's earned that. He's built that that mm-hmm. freedom to be able to do it. Um, why is Joe? And Joe's a comedian and a podcaster. I don't want to speak for him, partly because he p- is passionate about those things. But they also fit nicely into how he sees the world, which is he doesn't need a boss. He doesn't need some of these nonsensical structures. There are still people acting like you have to behave a certain way mm. in content, even though we we hang out in a place where people drink whiskey or smoke weed and swear. Still on television, you're not allowed to swear, and you're not allowed to, exp- you know, like there are these paradigms. Rules. Yeah, these rules. 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 Yeah. I mean, s- some rules are really important. Some rules give you a guideline of how to live or how to think or how to do art or how to do business. But a lot of them are bullshit. A lot of them aren't real. And when you figure out that they're not real, you allow yourself to to expand your life and your knowledge and, you know, you, you accomplish mm. more things. And you, you you have a little more excitement. Wow, that's incredible. I'm super pumped to have you. Yeah, man. It's, yeah, I'm, me too. I, I'm uh, super pumped. Just because it's... Uh, because of the Elias thing too, coming back mm-hmm. and, and then having you because you know, you're a big inspiration to to a lot of the MMA community. Yeah, it's, it's crazy you know, that when you say that, it's crazy when you say that. You know, um, so you don't see it. That's what that's what makes you more. You that's make, that's what makes you better because like, you're like you're not going. Well, of course. Well, it's you, fucking you, weird. You're like, really? Like, that's because weird. Because I'm only twelve years mm. from being a guy who who was saying, listen. I fucking, like, I love martial arts and connect to them in a way that I think some people will be interested. I think it might be, it might offer something to somebody. Uh, and and people, and of course, people in Canada, the internet was around then, so, you know, the underground and Sherdog and stuff existed and, and had for a long time. So in those communities, people were like, who the fuck is this guy? And why mm-hmm. is anybody paying attention to him? And didn't he wear eye makeup and play in a rock band? But in Canada, they were just, like, not having it. It's like... Mm-hmm. Whoever's going to fight this guy, kill him and send him home and make sure he's got nothing to do with our fucking sport and art form. Like, I, Cause they, I, they hated me. Because I see, I grew up in Toronto, and I only knew you as the glam rocker. Yeah. Because yeah. I remember, I think I, I told my buddy who lives in Miami, and I, I said, hey, I go, uh, you're not going to believe this, bro. Robin Black is is working, my, like, my, it was my first yeah. pro show. He's going to work the, the pro show, and he's like, the glam rocker? <laughs> that's what he, because yeah, yeah, we were from, yeah. like, Toronto yeah. those days, back, yeah. like, 80s, 90s to 2000. Yeah. Like we, everybody knew who you yeah. were because it was like there was the VJ much. VJ yeah, yeah. Search. That was pretty neat. Yeah, right? it was, it was pretty, pretty cool. It was a pretty neat job. But, it was a weird one. But you didn't. You don't look yeah. the same. Like yeah. you were a completely yeah. different guy. Yeah, you were and, the same guy. Yeah. But you just yeah. looked different. Yeah, you it was the it, makeup and the tattoo. A costume, You're a rock star, right? Yeah. There's a costume or a or a wardrobe or a uniform for any kind of job, yeah. you know? And um, that one, and in whatever, within, you don't have to observe the uniform, but if you do, you would then express it your own way. And people mm. who sing in a rock band, I mean, I also like the flash of it. and That was part, a lot more of my personality at the time. But if you take a hundred, if you find a hundred people who know my name now, um, and they might not even, but you might say, hey, one minute breakdown, Bink. And they go, oh, yeah, yeah, I watched some of those videos. They all know you. Yeah. Everybody knows. And, and you yeah. said that guy played in a rock band 10 years ago. They'd be like, what? Like yeah. now nobody. Now it's a very tiny. How, does, how do you feel about that? I is like that, that. Do you? I do. I yeah. really do. I really do. I'm, I'm, I'm super proud that, that I, like I have two albums that I made with like two of the greatest producers in the world. One of them's name is Garth Richardson. He produced Rage Against the Machine. So Rage Against the Machine is coming back right now. Mm-hmm. So I see Garth popping up everywhere on my Facebook feed. And I'm like, fuck. And he's one of the great producers ever. His father was Jack Richardson, was one of the greatest producers. And then he co-produced my second record with a guy named Bob Ezrin. Bob produced Pink Floyd The Wall like Kiss Destroyer, Peter Gabriel, like Lou Reed, like some of the greatest records of all time. Mm. I have those forever. Like those two, and I haven't listened to them in years. And partly because when I do, it'll be really cool because I haven't listened mm. to them in years, you know? Uh, if I put them on, and I don't know exactly where they are, but I know I have them in my in my bookshelf probably somewhere. I'll be proud of those forever. Like those exist forever, and people don't even make CDs anymore. Mm. You know, some of those like cool things that I did, and you know, there's music videos that we made, and they were some of them were my ideas, and some of the looks and the and some of the lyrics. Like I made that. I was involved in that stuff, mm. and 
And so I'm proud of it. But at the same time, I'm way more proud of what I do now, like way more proud because what I do now, I feel like is the, the result of real, real, real work, like real work. Like, and it's not, I don't think of it as hard work because it's what I love, but I've just kept learning and learning more and learning how to learn and getting better at getting better and just kept working the process until now I really, like, I really do see when human beings are moving their bodies in contradictory ways, I see it in ways that very few human beings do. And I know there are coaches that see it in diff entirely different ways than I do and martial artists that do. But I'm, I'm seeing things that exist, that are happening, that I s really need to explain. Like what's really happening in the brains of these people as this is happening. And I do this all the time. I'll look at, when we're commentating the fights and Elias is fighting the Brazilian gentleman that will probably be announced by the time we're listening to this. Who's a probably, dangerous. It's probably announced now. Yeah. He's a dangerous <clears throat> guy. I think dangerous. he has 20 wins. Yeah, he's like 20. He's like yeah. 20 and 7 Three, or something yeah, or like five that. Yeah, something. I think yeah. It's, yeah, he's a dangerous guy. It's a good fight. But I'll watch those guys. And you see their bodies moving. So a lot of times what we do is we'll, we'll talk about the punch or mm -hmm. the kick or the, gra the grab or the choke. But if you, it takes a while to do this. And, I mean, it's useful information to how you look at anything. But eventually, it isn't about the punch or the kick or the choke. It's about the relationship between the two bodies. Mm -hmm. What is happening? Because no kick exists in, in, you know, in a vacuum. It exists while you are moving and making decisions. So in that moment, that kick landed, but it's not because you've, quote, got a good kick. It's because of all of the interdimensional things that happen with vision and timing and faking and getting you understanding when you're standing still or forcing mm -hmm. you to stand still. Or, uh, But a lot of it is psychological and a lot of it is a dynamic between two brains. But I'll watch it and I'll imagine, blur my vision, to imagine just... Within that sort of blurry vision of the two bodies, you just see these two brains. These two brains are moving around each other. Mm -hmm. And then you look into it and you see the the um, spinal cord. The spinal cord. And the then nerves. you see all the little red, little uh, red uh, senses and nerves and stuff. And you just look at them as just little outlines of mm -hmm. just just picture only their nervous system. And as you do. It, and you now you don't have eyes, ears, and whatever. You just have a brain and the nervous system. And you see that the motions are related. And they're not only related through, I saw him do a faint, so I thought this and did that. There is a connection be that has happened, a, a mm -hmm. connection between the two brains that's happened. And we, we see this in cooperative things a lot. You know, you'll see, um, if you've ever watched those contortionists that are families and together they'll move and they'll shape each other that's when they're connected or dancers mm -hmm. but this is somehow they're in conflict so there's a jumpiness at times or or a pressure or a or a, a, a fear or a hesitation and there's a relationship between when somebody's aggressive and the other one's aggressive or someone's aggressive and the other one moves away all of it is connected through the brains and the nervous systems you go a couple layers deeper. Yes, the eyes are part of gathering that information and the ears and the pressure sensors of the feet. There's something called proprioception, which is another sense, your ability to understand where you are in space. That's a highly developed sense. So you start watching that shit mm -hmm. and you're like, once, you, once you're able to start to look at that, all it leaves me with are questions. Like, well, how is this happening? What's the relationship? Do we have verbiage for it? You know, I so I start to talk to a nervous system doctor or a, a spinal cord specialist or like Dr. Stu McGill. Or I, I uh, start to work with a, a professor of psychology, you know, like David, Dr. David Klonsky. He and I are writing a book. It's going very slow. He's much faster of a writer than I, but we're writing a book about combat sports psychology together. You start looking at these things and you realize, fuck, I could study for 20 years and never have the answer to this. Mm. Uh, but... I now have the questions. I now see questions. And that took my adult lifetime to get there. Mm -hmm. It took my adult, and to understand how we learn and how we respond and how we change and how we hone that. I started to study for a little while um, the, the minds of, of, there's tons of literature and tons of research on it, of the fastball hitter. The fastball hitter literally sees the baseball different than you and I. We'll stand there. Of course we can't hit that fucking baseball. It's going 100, 100 miles an hour. We can't hit it. So how can he hit it? 
he's literally seeing it different. He's trained his eye, his nervous system, and his brain. They'll see, not we won't even see the ball. They'll see the laces on it as it spins through the air towards them. How the fuck is that possible? Well, science can explain it. Neurologists can explain it. It can be explained. But once you start getting into that stuff, I may never use any of that as a commentator. Mm -hmm. But if I understand it, it changes my relationship to what I see. And if it changes my relationship to what I see, it does it in a way that I'm more blown away by it. So I'm looking for better verbiage and better ways to explain it and deeper ways to make and better analogies for people to understand it as something more than this stuff is so yeah, good. Yeah, man. thanks, man. Because it like when I watch it, because I, I, I'll watch a breakdown and then I'll watch it over and over and over and over again. I'm like, this guy must have watched this for like a month. <laughs> like, did he did you watch that fight for a month to try? And then it's like, I, I can't sometimes even... I saw it only one time, like literally That's amazing. I, when I commentate. It, I'm the part, a big part of the goal. Now it's become its own thing that I love to do, and people seem to really enjoy seeing. But, but the original goal was just to be a better commentator because mm-hmm. live commentary is the you know is the pinnacle of it. Is can you do it live? And once you get to the point that you're seeing things different and you understand different connections and you see the beauty and the, the fascinating things about it and different ways to explain it, now you're a better commentator. Now we get away from just imitating Joe Rogan for fucking 10 years or mm-hmm. using the same paradigms. This guy's grappling is better, but this guy, oh, great takedown defense. Like, this isn't real. What we, you are not, in most cases, we are not analyzing anything. We are saying the words that we've heard other people say mm-hmm. when you're certain right. things happening. Yeah, That's so, not right. analysis. Analysis isn't, you know, and that's also why it isn't possible to really be, yeah, maybe it is possible, but it, it'll be different um, to really analyze something without doing it. Because if all you know about where to put the foot in Southpaw versus Orthodox is what you heard Brian Stan say, you don't understand it at all. You just know when you see that foot, you say that thing. And that thing isn't even true. When mm-hmm. Brian, the Southpaw versus Orthodox, you always got to keep your front foot on the outside. That's not true. That's mm-hmm. that's a novice truth. That's a novice truth taught to, to young kids that when fighters get better, they know that's not true. They use that against anyone who thinks that's true. The better fighter uses that against them. Mm-hmm. But if you don't know that, you've just imitated every time you heard Brian Stan or Dominic Cruz. Or, it sounds good. Or mm-hmm. Joe Rogan or somebody really good. You just say it, too. You don't know why or how or what it means or why it would mean that way. Or even to look a layer deeper, if you believe that I can't. Uh, drink that that Coke straight out of the bottle and I do it, you're like, holy shit, I can't believe he did it. Mm-hmm. That's the whole point. If you believe I can't stick my foot somewhere or I can't drop my hand or I can't move my chin out and then I do it, it fucks with you. We, I just broke some rule and yet it worked. Now it starts to undermine your entire mm-hmm. ability to process whatever we're doing. If that thing's a fight, that really sucks. Getting punched in the face in front of all your friends <laughs> in your underpants now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and you did that. Yeah. I did, yeah. yeah. yeah you did yeah. that. The proudest thing that for me is when somebody says, this is Robin, he used to be a fighter. Like whether anyone knows anything about fighting or not, Mm -hmm. like especially often when they don't, I just think to myself, fuck, that's so, I'm so proud of that. And I wasn't the best fighter, but I had some bad moments and I had some good moments and I won a couple fights and, and I did it. And when I, when I failed and was hurt bad or, or humiliated, I did it again. Mm -hmm. And that I'm even proud of, even prouder of. The reason most people don't do shit and it's not their fault they're just scared to be humiliated. Yeah, you got balls fail. of steel. Yeah, I mean, but you just, you just, you just scare. Everybody's scared too. They just do it anyways. Yeah, you know. That's like, why I did the podcast. Be ex- yeah, exactly. It scares the shit out of me. Is it still? It's, it's all that, yeah, yeah, a little bit. But yeah. then once you're in it, it's not scary at all. Now we're sitting here having I, a whiskey. I, see, I find it's easier when the cameras aren't rolling. Yeah. When they're not, there's no pressure. We're just sitting in the room. We're just shooting the shit. Yeah. Because then I don't feel, I don't feel yeah. the pressure. But when it's on, I'm like. Well, but it's getting it's getting better. It's getting easier, and you know, a lot of times it's having really smart guests, like people that can talk. You know, people that are good, and I just kind of pu- puppeteer. You know, the best podcasters, and I'm I'm when I sit in that chair, it's something I want to improve on. Is like the if you if you listen, the guy will talk. Mm-hmm. I talk a little too much when I'm in that chair. I feel like mm-hmm. like whereas 
the guy, we talked about Joe. Of course, he's the biggest podcaster in the world. Joe's got a lot to say. He's a fucking smart guy. But there'll be long periods of time he'll just sit back and, and be comfortable, be somebody comfortable to talk to. That's a skill in and of itself. Yeah. If, you, if, if you had, you know, Steve Molitor pouring his heart out to you mm -hmm. with cameras rolling, it's because you made him feel comfortable. You know, they may not feel comfortable enough to, to talk, but cameras are still weird. They're just different weird. Like, of course, no matter how many times you're on camera, you're still like, uh, you know, am I out of shape? You know, my hairline's receding. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got gray side. Like, we all are regular people. Everybody. It doesn't matter. In fact, when you see those, like, famous people and they have, like, all the implants and everything done, you can see that they're feeling that pain a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, they feel like they're... They look weird, or they don't like the sound of their voice, or they, like everybody's insecure. It, it's something I see a lot now, and I think it's a really good thing. I don't know why we're seeing it more, but people will acknowledge that they're frightened, or that they're stressed, or that like mental health and fear and anxiety is real. Mm -hmm. You hear about that a lot now, and I think it's really good because everybody's a little fucked. The mm -hmm. most successful people that you know are scared of something. Some of them are scared of general things. They're scared of fucking global warming or they're scared of, you know, the president or they're scared of their business shutting down. Some people are scared that somebody will find out they're not who they really think they are. They're scared that, you know, the tax man will like people are fucking scared. They're a little bit stressed. They're mm -hmm. a little anxious. They're they're fearful about the future. Um, that's normal. And I. Anybody who's feeling those things, when they hear that's normal, they still okay. feel those things, but they're like, wait, it's normal? Oh, okay, oh, good. Yeah, oh, good. that's good. That you mean those? You mean fucking Beyonce feels stressed too? Yeah. Like, you mean, like, you mean uh, Tom Cruise feels. Tom Cruise is a Scientologist. He probably feels a lot of stress. Yeah. Or maybe he doesn't. <laughs> I don't maybe that's does. the secret. I don't think he does. Yeah, maybe that's the secret. Maybe you gotta maybe it's those aliens in the fucking volcano or whatever, whatever the hell they believe. And. <clears throat> I mean, I was about to say no judgment, but I do judge that a little bit, like mm -hmm. just a little. Like, I don't want to judge anybody's belief, but but no, I don't. Actually, I don't judge that. If you know the process of Scientology, mm -hmm. at least from the limited amount we've been shown, which may, of course, we, may, we are probably missing a lot of information. Slowly, you're brought along without being told too much until later you're so deep in it and you spent so much money. They're like, by the way, it's aliens in a volcano or something like that. <laughs> and you're like. Well, we're here now. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? I think <laughs> we're already here. We're already here, right? Um, I think you can't judge people's beliefs. Like, for for the most part, if you're doing pretty good or you're fairly happy with how things are going, um, you count yourself lucky because a lot of the things people, most of the things most of us believe have been allotted to us somewhere. Mm -hmm. Your parents gave you a religion or, you know, teachers told you you were a hard worker or not a hard worker or somebody said you were pretty or ugly when you were a kid and you believe some of those things. So to mm -hmm. a certain degree, we're all, if you're doing all right, you're pretty lucky because that fire was a, uh, that fire is a solid. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I thought fire was a solid when yeah. I was a kid. I believed everything my dad said. No fire was a liquid. That's I believe fire was a liquid. Was. Yeah. He also told me when I was a kid that once upon a time, there was a because I, we were really into Guinness, the Guinness World Book of Records when I was a kid. That was a very popular. Everybody thing. was. I yeah, think. I think so. Right. It was the first book you grabbed at the yeah, library. Yeah, late seventies <coughs> to late eighties. I think that was a mm. pretty popular thing. Maybe it still is now. I don't know. It still is. Yeah. It's actually the most stone, stolen book out of every library. Really? Yeah. Doesn't surprise me. Yeah. There's something in it. It's a, that, actually, I think yeah. it's the Guinness Book of World <laughs> Records for being yeah. the most stolen. Book That's amazing. Out of, yeah. yeah. That's ironic. amazing. Uh, yeah, he told me that there was one in there that they just didn't include, where a guy once took a shit. And it was the exact, like, a perfect globe with, like, all of the countries and the oceans Get perfectly up. shaped. Yeah, and I believe that I was, like, <laughs> seven years old. And and I don't know why, but, I mean, think about it. It's like all kids are told that yeah. Santa's real. Yeah. I mean, we're lied to a fair bit, like, all well, the time. Well, he's not real. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> what? <you know? laughs> when I was a kid, actually, I heard, um, and I heard, I saw Mommy kissing Santa Claus. Mm -hmm. Like, even at 16 or 17, it, it still never crossed my mind that was daddy dressed as Santa. Yeah. Like it just, I was in my 20s before I'm like, oh, I get it. I just thought it was like she's literally Mom's she was whore. kissing the, yeah, she was uh. kissing that old, <laughs> that old freaky dude from the I'm North Pole. Trying Hall. to get extra presents. Yeah, exactly. Slut. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But then, yeah, somewhere in my 20s, I'm like, oh, I got it. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, don't feel bad. I thought a, I thought a pony was a baby horse. Isn't like it? Like five years ago. Isn't I, it? No. No? Oh, no, I well. guess a pony's a pony. Yeah. Are you sure? I'm pretty sure. Okay. Yeah. Do they call baby horses ponies? No. They what call, do they call them? Um, Fawns? N- no. I don't know. Mustangs? Yeah. No, no Mustangs are like muscular, tough ones. No, it's I think. Like, uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Fall. 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 Wow. Yeah. Hmm. Foul. Fall. Foul. Fall. Fall. It's kind of a letdown. I thought it'd be better than that. So, December 6th. Yeah. I finally have it. Have you seen the fight card yet? Let's pull it up. I know uh, both Laramies, Mm -hmm. which they haven't fought on the same card too many times. You'd think they would have more. The last three. The last two, sorry. Yeah. The last two with me, both both times. Uh, Let's pull up. Actually, let's pull up what. Let's pull up. For anybody listening that isn't from Canada, Top MMA News. It's like. They've been around forever, and they let me down every time. Do they? They do. Do they get it wrong? They, I don't know. I just they 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 don't cover it as much as they used yeah. to. Yeah, yeah, well, it's time. But too, it's right? uh, but also yeah. regional is, hasn't well, has that, it's slowed down for a bit. That and too, right? and these things are run by people in their spare time. Absolutely. Like these, you know, these kind of even topology and ones like mm-hmm. that. This that's the new one now, yeah, and that's the ones one. that commissions are using. Really? Yeah. Oh, good used, for those because they used to use. Uh, uh, underground, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. Which, which, Kirik is my man. Like yeah. he's a good friend, but you know they haven't been. He doesn't have the staff. And Sure Dog, they wouldn't use for a long time. And Sure Dog was the closest to mm-hmm. getting it for a long time. But Tapology, Tapology is the legit one now. That's I one. understand that there are a bunch of young dudes who just all work together and probably smoke bales of weed and just mm-hmm. compile it all, which is cool. No, uh, they, they've done a really good job. I they really have. They, when they first reached out to me about putting my events on the topology, yeah. I didn't know what it was, but you just send them, the, you send it to them anyways, just because it was a media source, right? There's two other Canadian uh, cards on in Edmonton and Fort McMurray that night. Yeah. Crazy. Shane Campbell. Oh, is uh, he? It's fighting on the... Uh, Unified? Unified. Yeah. He's cool. he's probably one of my favorite yeah, Canadian he's fighters really, too. I used to watch really him fight good. on the uh, reserves all the time, yeah, and he yeah. fucking crush guys. Yeah, he is. He's his striking is phenomenal. Anyone that came out of the Alain camp, yeah, House yeah. of Champions, yeah. they're all killers. Yeah. Mukai, do you remember M- Mukai, Mukai Moramo? Yeah, yeah. he's yeah. another high level. Yeah, Alain uh, is now the cut man, uh, one of the cut men for Canada, and I think even Australia mm-hmm. when the UFC. It's often the same crew of people that goes to Canada and Australia. So he and so it's cool to see him doing that. He probably it's it's not easy work, the travel and mm-hmm. stuff. Um but I bet he loves it. I bet he loves it. Oh I know because he loves he's it. deep deep yeah. in Dennis Purick, you ever see him? Yeah. He's another one that's yeah, Dennis crush. I'm a, he's gonna be a guest in a couple of weeks no way. if he's back. Yeah yeah because oh, I'm I'm actually I'm like Dennis we have to talk man because Yeah cool. Like, he's he, lived a life. And yeah, yeah and he's one of those like traveling yeah, martial artist. Yeah, like he just Russia. goes and trains with Bukal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just yeah. and he's, a, I think he's, he's a killer. He is. He yeah. is he, There's so, well, look at your, uh, the card in a second, um, because I'm looking at it. It's like it is gonna be good. It is gonna be real good. Uh, I'm stoked to do it. Uh, tell me about who I'm working with, uh, commentator Kara Rowe. Yeah, do I know her? Have I met uh, her? She's a professional boxer. I'm um, sure I know. She her. coaches uh, Cody Stamen, uh, Darren Crookshank. Oh, uh, over at Michigan, Michigan Top Team. She lives oh, in Windsor. She's a radio awesome. radio broadcaster at it. I'm, AM 800, yeah. I think it is I'm in stoked. Windsor. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm stoked. Uh, but she's really good. Yeah. She worked the last two events for me. In it, and um, Let me tell you, the, the combination of being a martial arts coach and a broadcaster is super rare. Like mm-hmm. a, a real broadcast. So she, she has the number one seat here, right? So she is, that's the hard job. Mm-hmm. The, well, at least for me. The natural job for me and for anybody that has fought or coached like her is often the analyst job. The broadcaster has a hard job. Welcome, we're here at this place with stats, figures, times, structures, records, all that stuff. And I'm here with my broadcast partner, Robin Black. Robin, just say some fun stuff about fighting, yeah. right? Like that's she's yeah. the way because she works job. with TJ and Tony. Oh, she cool. does the strike. It does. I'm sure training. I've met her. You I'm very excited her. to work with her, and and I'll learn a lot from her because. And like I said, that combination of pro broadcasting but also being a martial artist is super rare. Mm-hmm. You know, think of Mike Goldberg, Moral Ronaldo, you know, John Anik. Like these aren't coaches or fighters; mm-hmm. these are just broadcasters. So mm-hmm. Moral Ronaldo did the uh, documentary on Stephen Moral. So that's where this whole wow. thing. That's where the whole thing is uh, happening. Yeah, uh, yeah, cool. Yeah, just, that's because you just said the name. Yeah, Moral's he's a genius. Yeah. I learned a. You learn a lot when you work with Moral, man. But yeah, so I'm thrilled to work with her. There was something else we just... Oh, Dennis. So 
people will say this, and even you know people with lots of knowledge and education uh, about the human body and fighting and stuff will say this. Um, they'll be like, power can't be taught or something you're born with or or uh, you either have it or you don't. It's like, that's not fucking true, right? Like, that's not true at all. Like, the reason I mention this is because the power Dennis generates from his bantamweight frame is shocking. Yeah, he's it's so explosive. shocking, shocking. But I don't believe that. And the science doesn't believe that. Mm -hmm. Because, and Conor McGregor is an example that people will mention. Even geniuses. For us, Sahabi is a genius. He's a brilliant martial artist. And he'll be like, Conor McGregor has the touch of death. Uh, you know, he has that power that you're either born with or not. He knows that's not true. Now, and I'm not saying that to be, a, you know, be rude. And we're friends. I'll, if, I'll text him and say, hey, I would literally text Faraz in the middle of the night to be like, hey, man, I want to talk to you about Conor McGregor's power. And he'd be like, all right, let's do this. Because he's, a, he's an obsessive mm -hmm fight nerd and he's a genius i am not um but he will say yeah he has that natural power no he doesn't because when he fought habib he didn't have the same power why there was a genetic predisposition to the ability to have an explosive structure to have hips core body that is able to turn into a great running back or a great hitter great you know martial artist but you're not born with it. It's a result of your training and preparation. Mm -hmm. Now, you're, the maximum capacity to generate force of Dennis Puric is much higher than of me. So that's true. But the truth that Dennis Puric was born with it, Dennis Puric can hit that hard because he also trained a lot mm -hmm. and became um, mechanically efficient. When he fucking hits something, and I'll, I'll marvel at the impact but my brain, as somebody who looks at movement, is marveling at the efficiency of the way he's moving. The mm -hmm. reason he hits so hard is a combination of that little bit of genetic predisposition to if you worked him really hard, what he would be capable of. Same with Connor. To say Connor naturally has this powerful left hand, when you when he didn't know how to box, he didn't have it. Mm -hmm. Then he learned how to box <clears throat> and now he has it. Automatically we say it's a result of training, right? Um so, but I always find those little things so interesting. Even like we say things often like that. Even people who know better will say them. Like if you're a coach, you've coached a thousand people, all of whom hit harder when they got better at throwing punches or kicks. Mm -hmm. And yet you'll mm -hmm. still say they're either born with it or they're not, even though you saw them improve with work, yeah. right? You know, it's just, it's a strange thing. You are, humans are weird. Like we really are, but we're fascinatingly weird and beautifully weird. You know, mm -hmm. absolutely. But um, yeah, take a look at this so card. card. So TJ Andrew Cruz, seven and three. He's been around. I don't know if I know him. Uh, Where's he from? These, these guys went out and interviewed him in Boise, Idaho. He's from, Ooh, he's cool. from Boise, Idaho. Cool. Uh, tough American kid. Yeah. Um, Front Street Fights was there. I think he's. he's oh yeah. Worked. Front Street Fights was the champ. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. 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 Are we going to hang or like we're going to all take a break? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah let's do it. Okay. Yeah, quick break? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, yeah, cool. We're going to take a week anyway. Yeah. That Cheers. works perfect. Yeah, absolutely. This is amazing. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Fun. <clears throat> okay. Um, okay, we're just going to pick up right now just after a quick little break. Uh, we weren't used to keeping these guys sitting in the seats squirming. I had to take, yeah. I had to take sitting a, there going, what, take a leak what anyway, are these guys but, babbling about? Yeah, sorry, we get get caught up. I'm I'm good though. This is good. We set a record today, wow, which was for cool. the uh, for the longest podcast nice. shot. So Chris Clement's gonna have to come back. Yeah, <laughs> twice as long. Yeah, come back. Yeah. Uh, we'll be more ready for yeah. him next time. A too. year from now, it'll be like a 36 hour podcast. Yeah, that'd be yeah. cool. Yeah, <laughs> no, it'd be too much. Take mushrooms. And um, so let's just quickly revisit this fight card. Okay. Yeah. Um. So of course, Elias. We talked about Elias, mm -hmm. right? That's cool. So are you gonna main event him? No, he's gonna be the co-main. So we got the uh. Featherweight title, which yep. is TJ versus yep. Andrew Cruz. Yep. And then we're going to go the co-main, M-A-N-E. Yeah. yeah uh, right. And it actually gives yeah. Reno a little bit of a break, That's too. That's good. So and right to before back, him, right. TJ? T uh, Tony. Tony yeah. first. Yeah. Uh, Elias second and TJ third of the top three T uh, yeah, so yeah. So TJ, the main. Yeah. yeah. Elias, the co-main. Yeah. Tony, yeah, that is good for the coach, too. Yeah, it gives and him then, a little bit of a break, right? And so where are we broadcasting this? Or is it... Uh, 
Where are we? Uh, I, haven't fu- it? I haven't fully announced it yet, but we are going to do a pay per view. Wicked. Uh, Wicked. So that's Wicked. that's the plan. But that's uh, good. so I guess we just yeah. pretty much announced it. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll get out the details yeah, yeah. and we'll put them out over social media. Yeah, so absolutely. People can see it. So will you run all eleven fights mm-hmm. all? It's separated into a main card and open, or just run it through and have a little um, break. In the I pretty, I have a little break in the middle. Yeah. Um, I used, to, I like to pump them out yeah, fast. I know. Like just bang, boom, bang, boom. Get them in, yeah. get them out. Yeah. Fighters like it. Audience <clears throat> likes it. Like, mm-hmm. you know, what are we doing here? How many? Um, <laughs> whenever you see a new promoter, they all make all the same errors, and it's the funny thing is when they sort of act like well, they clearly don't even know what the error is. So you'll see somebody that's like, bro. I'm going to put on 10 fights, five, and then we'll have a big intermission, and, like, this Megadeth cover band's going to play. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, it's, all, it's always everybody who tells you they've got a metal band in the intermission mm-hmm. acts like they're the first one to think of it. It's been done 100 times, and it fails every time. Yeah. The audience doesn't like it. Doesn't it work. Doesn't, it doesn't work. work. It doesn't work. But, you know, yeah. It's And that I said Megadeth cover band because, um, what was that one? Uh the uh, the fight card named after the T-shirt company, Fedor fought Tim Sylvia. Affliction. Affliction. Afflictions for a show. They had Megadeth play in the intermission. <laughs> did they really? They did. Yeah, they did. So yeah, I'm excited for uh, for TJ too. I mean, I really like I really like those kids a lot. How's Tony? Like, uh, Tony, is he in shape? Is he healthy? Tony, listen, Tony is a yeah a different I love beast, him. man. Yeah, he's a different. But he beast. had some injuries. Like he'd hurt himself. He'd, he'd, with, with the Jordan Grant fight, it was really yeah. bad. Really. It was really yeah, but he's fully back. Yeah, he's fully healed. Yeah. He just he just retired Darren Nemo. Yeah. Um, on your last show? On the last the, show. The one you did with Faisal? Yeah. Oh, Faisal and uh, head kicked uh, Sam Dobaki. Mm. Uh, he's so good. Out of the first. How he, old is he now? He's 19. Still? Yeah. Ni- still, still, <laughs> still 19, yeah, 20? Yeah, Jeez. Yeah. That's yeah, terrifying. Uh, T- I had TJ on, and, yeah. we, and we talked about yeah. it. And, and TJ explained it. TJ's very, very aware. Mm-hmm. And he, he said, is. He said to me, he goes, you know, I, I like to be more methodical and more patient. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can grind out a win. I know I can, you know, yeah. I know what I have to do. Yeah. Tony and, and, just bites down on his, yeah, on his mouth guard and just yeah. goes. He does. He just, he doesn't give a yeah. shit. He's also, he no is fear. very skilled as mm-hmm. well. Like, we're incredibly skilled as well. And that combination works. Like, mm-hmm. if, if you take somebody who isn't as skilled as Tony and they have no fear and they bite down, they're going to lose as much as they win. Mm-hmm. When you take somebody who is as skilled as Tony and as, as as elegant in the way he puts his game together and as smooth and as explosive and as special of a fighter and he bites down like that, he's going to win a lot more than he loses. And when he loses, it's going to be tough. It's always tough on these guys, especially the good ones. But mm-hmm. when he wins, it's going to be spectacular. But the thing that's like you got to remember, these guys are high, high level when they were like 15. Children. Children. Like kids. Yeah. Like very, like when, when all the kids yeah. were going to school and uh, trading Pokemon cards yeah. and talking sports, these yeah. guys were at the gym grinding out, doing yeah. wrestling, jujitsu, striking. T- and I actually forgot, TJ fought for me as, as a kickboxer when he was 15 really? years old. Yeah. Really? And he destroyed yeah. a kid. I, I really love those kids. I lo- me like, too. Well, I you've love, seen them grow yeah. too, right? Yeah. I got to commentate them. And, uh, and, I really like that they've had challenges. Like the idea, they never had the idea jammed in their head that they were just going to beat everybody forever, mm-hmm. and that's good um, because that's that's, that's just, Reno uh, too, yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. Well, mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, the coach, uh, mm-hmm. they're just their coach is special too, right? And not just special with like the skills, the punches and the kicks, but he's he's got a sophisticated thinking. Like he cares about them. There's mm-hmm. It's the a, way Tompkins was with the yeah, Adrian Allen boys. Actually, so. that's a really good analogy. Yeah. And that tough one. People, people who don't sort of know that story, Sean Tompkins' connection to Mark Hominick, Sam Stout, and Chris Hordesky, part of the winning was Sean would call out a combination. You know, straight right, left hook, low kick. They would throw it, and it worked. But the reason it worked was because they threw it with full commitment. Yes. And the reason they threw it with full commitment was because they trusted Sean implicitly. Mm-hmm. So, yes, he had the right combination. But because they knew he had the right combination, they threw it with full commitment to the combination, which also made it the right combination. Mm-hmm. And Reno's the same with those guys. And I'm sure I don't – when I see them, they have a beautiful relationship. I'm sure it's not perfect all the time mm-hmm. either, which is also good. 
You know, there's a push and a pull of it. But I hope those guys are with him seven, nine, ten years I from think now. They will be. I think they will. I too. think they I really will hope too. they are, because the relate. I've seen it so many times. These special talents. Yeah, of course you go and you learn something somewhere else. Of course you go and you gather another piece of information. Mm -hmm. You know, you go and you work with another coach and a team with your coach and stuff. But I've seen these people leave and go to great, brilliant gyms, you know, mm -hmm. Henzo Gracie or Greg Jackson's geniuses. And it just isn't the same because the connection of coach and fighter is special. You know, it's, it, it's deeper. Like it's a deeper understanding of what's happening. It isn't just... I say this, this is how you kick, this is how you punch, this is, mm -hmm. it's, it's the relationship between it's his the knowledge. the in-between. Yeah, it is, exactly. You know, the it's, weight yeah. cuts, yeah. The, the leading yeah. up to preparation, yeah. the how you handle yourself with yeah. media, how you do uh, sponsorship, how, it's, there's a whole working pack yeah. package, and that's kind of why I went into the amateur side of things, because I mm. thought, you know what, maybe I can groom these guys the way I would like them mm. to be as professionals. Yeah. You know, show them yeah. that, hey, this is how you got to do all your blood work and yeah. all your medicals yeah. and Things got to be in on time, yeah. or there's going to be repercussions. You just don't fight. Yeah, exactly. You know. Yeah. So, I mean, that was the whole point with the amateur scene. But anyways, yeah, well, uh, the, I I hope people like, you know, see these guys too. Like, there's a lot of good fights on here, and a lot of like tough, rugged fighters. But I, I hope that people see these guys. They've seen them on some fight pass fights, and they've seen them. But th there's something special about them, and and the fact that they they got to have a loss or two mm -hmm. is key. It's like when they're world champions, the key to it will have been a few of these like, holy shit, I'm better than that guy. I work harder. I'm more skilled than that guy. And I didn't win tonight. How did that happen? And what you do is you learn these little in-betweens, these little truths about about self-improvement and preparation and mm -hmm. the moment and stuff. And those truths are only learned by that that unbelievable, painful, like incredibly painful realization on Sunday that I should win that and I didn't. What happened? Mm -hmm. And w when the when the young greats get to like, and I mean it, get to have that experience, try their best, come in prepared, and fail. That makes them better. That and it's it's rare, but when it happens, it's shocking that without those setbacks, somebody becomes truly great. And they're they're the rare, unique version. But but it's better to experience those things. Absolutely, they yeah. they seem like completely different fighters. I can't wait. Yeah, I can't. I really can't wait. There's some other like there's a few uh, on here. Like I look at some of these these fighters that. Noah Crosswell is interesting. How many fights does Noah have? Uh, he's has a he's a ton of amateur fights. Yeah. He comes from a Taekwondo gym near Crosswell at Hamilton. Yeah. Does his jujitsu with Jeff yeah. Jocelyn. Yeah. Um, yeah. Neat. Grinding kind of Jamaican neat, kid. Yeah, uh, kind of a neat fighter. Joe Pateticus Pate Pate too. Like I've called a couple yeah. of his fights. I always like him. He's That's seen, actually a really yeah. good fight too. Yeah. Pateticus and Condi. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Both bangers. Both. Yeah. Uh, both real uh, heavy hitters. Rugged. Yeah. Yeah. Is Reno training Pateticus too? Yep. Yeah. And uh, so. You look at some of these fighters too, and and when you get to call it or break it down and stuff, sometimes it's just these weird little things that are different. It's like his from his neck to his hips is really long, mm -hmm. like Pateticus. You you're watching yeah. him fight, yeah. and you're like, just the structure of his body is just a little different, yeah. you know. And it makes it hard. And then he come, and the last time I called him fighting, he was just super rugged. Like there were, and I said it to Reno. Reno was really happy for him, and he was really happy. And I'm looking at it, and I'm like. I feel like he could have won that fight easier, but this made more sense to him. Mm -hmm. Like this felt like more the fight he needed to experience. For a lot of these guys too, it's like, I feel like we let them down. Like people who do my job and, and people like me, sometimes we let them down. It's like we we end up talking about the hype of something or we, we talk, you know, about the outcome. If they win this, it means that. And, you know, but each one of these fights and... You know, or on the way up, someone's like, and if they win this fight, the next stop's the UFC. Mm -hmm. we, we kept keep talking about these. But to, to these guys, if you really looked at it, some of the urgency and some of what's special about it when you're watching them fight is, no, there's no fucking UFC in two years or like, you know, some title belt in the future. Right now, right this minute, this is the most important thing in the world to these two kids. The most important, they, their whole lives have come to this moment. Their girlfriend's sitting right there and their parents are there and their families come to watch it and they feel that pressure like, I hope I can do it. You know, and the the, the realness of that is so special. Like it's mm -hmm. so, and you know, you 
on the the Thursday. This one's on a Friday. Or Friday, night. Friday It's a Friday. Yeah. yeah. So on the Thursday, you're like, I fucking hate this. Why am I doing this? <laughs> yeah. But on the Friday night, you're like, fuck, this is so special. Like mm. each so important to each one of these people. And we built this scenario in which they can have this moment, these this challenge, pass or fail. You know, get setback, learn, victory, whatever. And we get to celebrate it. And we get to share it with people. And when all these people come together in the arena, there's you. not everybody knows what it is. It's like, oh, man, we're going to see some fights. I hope we can see some knockouts, some people. Some other people are like, oh, bro, my friend is fighting. But somehow there's this sense of specialness that's going on. Mm -hmm. You don't know. We, we don't always verbalize it. But 22 human beings have fucking dedicated our... 20, 30, 40 hours a week for months and months, as well as all of their lives, and then, you know, cutting weight, saying no to birthday parties and all these other things in their mm -hmm. lives to come in and in these moments do that while we all get to watch. I mean, that's heavy. Mm -hmm. It's much heavier than we, I think we, we, we make a mistake often of looking to what the outcome might mean, and we forget to be like, holy shit, for the next 17 minutes, 15 of them or less, these two are going to do everything humanly possible mm -hmm. to push each other to the limit in hopes of what do you even get at the end sometimes? Like somebody holds your hand up and everyone cheers mm -hmm. and both of you have kicked the shit out of each other and you got a couple hundred dollars extra, but there's something about it. It's like, it's it's primal. Like it's mm -hmm. it's deeply meaningful just for what it is. See, that's why when I promote, I want I want every event to be better than the last one. For sure. Because I'm creating, I'm, in my head, I'm creating a memory for them. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so I would like them to walk away with it and go, man, that guy, he really did everything that he could to make sure that my, yeah, this fight, this journey leading up to it and then after was special. He will sure. never forget me. Yeah. Do you yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah, because, of because course. If he came in with me and, and his experience was bad yeah. and he didn't like me, I treated him like shit, yeah. I low budgeted everything, yeah. I made it garbage, yeah. then what good am I doing for him? For sure. For her. For sure. Right? And but you if, imagine if those 22, everybody associated with them, Every person in the room, everyone who watched the pay-per-view, mm -hmm. everyone, if they had a good time, isn't that what the fuck we're doing here? Like, aren't That's we all supposed to leave point. going, yeah. oh, man, that was wicked. Yeah. Wow, thank you. Do you, I just thought of something that I've noticed from Bellator and a couple other shows that I work up close. I mean, UFC and one and a lot of these. Do you have anybody there backstage to take their pictures right after they fought? Uh, I saw a... Uh, uh a magazine done by uh, a girl. She worked the score. Forget her name. Yeah, uh, Andrea Kellaway. Oh yeah. Do you know who I'm talking about? Yeah. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Kellaway. Andrea. I can't Kellaway. remember. I remember. She's it, wrestling. Yeah. I remember her. Oh yeah. Like yeah. And she did a a, Andrea, yeah. a a book on the fighters after the fight. And it was up close, very high, yeah. high detailed. Yeah. You yeah. saw the lumps, the yeah. bruises. Yeah. And I thought that was genius. Yeah. I thought it was really cool. Yeah. But at the same time, I. Just didn't want to put these guys through that. Hey, let me yeah. stick a camera in your yeah. face after I, you just got pulled I, over. I think even if it's you throw it out there from the podcast, is there a photographer around that? I think they might like that. Mm -hmm. Like I, that's why I brought a it. Side up. project, yeah, yeah. But uh, but even for them, yeah, like as a sort of a thank you to them, they to get even if it's somebody with like a half decent iPhone 11 mm -hmm. who's around. <laughs> On their way by, after the doctor, there's a backdrop there. Let's just take three or four quick shots of you for them. That I, When you said let's make sure they have a great experience and stuff, it might be really useful for you one day, but I feel mm -hmm. like it's a gift to them. Look at what you did. This is, And they'll be smiling, win or lose often. That like mm -hmm. This is you after one of the most special experiences of your life. That's a great idea. And yeah, send it out. Let's send it yeah. out now on somebody hit you up on Facebook, on the Prospects uh, Facebook page or something. Mm -hmm. You know, it might take you, ugh, fucking 30 people might want to do it. Mm -hmm. It might take you a bit of time to sift through them, but find one or two people with phones. Mm -hmm. And you know, ex you, don't, you don't need me to tell you this, but this is for other people who do things like this. We're What usually we're looking for is the people who need the least babysitting, the least <laughs> the, uh, direction, yeah. Yeah. the least leadership. We're going to send the least because m what m happens with most people who are listening right now going, I'd love to take those photos. You got to be the type of person who needs nothing. You don't, you understand that there's 22 fighters and 44 coaches, et cetera, et cetera, all who need things. You're going to know nothing. You're going to show up. Your name mm -hmm. will be on a list. And one person, not Jamie, if he's busy, is going to point to that spot and say, that's your spot. Take those. Yeah. And you're going to do everything. Do that. Yeah, yeah, I can yeah. set that up. Yeah. I like to see it before yeah. and after. Yeah, that would be really cool. Mm -hmm. before, That'd be really cool. Before going in. How, that's uh, awesome. Like, Split screen them for them. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. yeah. this is what your mindset is. This is yeah. what you look. You ever see? There's a, uh, uh, 
a thing where it's before war and after war. Yeah. You have you ever seen yeah. that? Yeah. And you I see have. that. You can yeah. see the solemnness. The change in them. Yeah. You can see the, the yeah. lost soul. Yeah, for you sure. Know? It won't for be sure. like that with the fight. No. But you'll see. You'll see a change. You'll see There'll the be a different, different person. Yeah. The adrenaline's gone. Yeah. The dump. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah. I'm going to yeah. do that. Yeah. And I'll find somebody yeah. to do that. And, and you know, when when you're busy trying to make sure that fighters have the best experience and the audience does, there's not going to be a budget for it. Mm-hmm. It's going to be somebody who wants to be able to do this and is going to be a self-starter and do it on their own and make sure they do it without getting in anyone's way. And then they're going to put the things together and give it to the fighter. And either they want that experience as a photographer or they don't. And if they do, we'll find the right person. It'll be really cool. Absolutely. Yeah. I'll do that. Yeah. I'm going to do that. Yeah. Let's wrap this up. Yeah, man. Let's. Yeah. Uh, I've only had one and a half drinks of uh, whiskey, yeah, so I same. can drive. I, I don't drink. Yeah. I'm surprised. You yeah. guys good? Everybody's good. Golden. This was yeah. fun, man. Yeah, I thank really you so much, yeah, man. Thank I, you. I truly appreciate yeah. it, man. Um, you want to... Mid January, you want to catch up again? We'll we'll sit down. We'll Let's talk do about some different shit. Hundred percent. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, absolutely. Man. Thank you so much, yeah. man. And uh, yeah. Good night. Enjoy the hostilities, my friends. Hmm? Hey, where can we find you? Um, if you don't I, find not following this guy already, that's the only um, reason I didn't bring it up. Uh, at Robin Black Martial Arts on Instagram. At Robin Black MMA on Twitter. Robin Black. dot com. No. Uh, YouTube. dot com slash Robin Black on YouTube. And uh, my podcast. That I don't do it as often now because with all the travel, but it's on most of the platforms. Some some of them are under Enjoy the Hostilities, and some of them are under Robin Black Podcast. But I say Enjoy the Hostilities; it's my shtick. Um, I uh, trademarked Enjoy the Hostilities, Bink, Bink, and One Minute Breakdown. Beautiful. I just did. Smart. Yeah, yeah. Smart. I, I just you have to. Yeah, I, that's you. It, it was Bruce Buffer who told me to do it. Mm-hmm. Bruce Buffer was like, "Bro, you got to make sure that you." Actually, I'm doing a moral Ronaldo there. Well, whatever <laughs> Bruce, Bruce's voice sounds like, he's like, "This is something that you've built that you have to do." Like, okay, sorry, yeah, I did. Smart. Yeah. yeah. Protect your investment. Yeah. yeah. All right, you're good, man, Robin. Cheers, Thank you man. so much. Thank you. This podcast is brought to you by Euro Sun Tanning Salon. Do you suffer from eczema or psoriasis? You have acne or sore muscles? Head on in today and visit the tanning beds. They got regular and mega stand-up beds. Get that beautifully tanned look that you're looking for. They also offer natural mystic spray tan. You can also purchase premium products such as Australian Gold, California Tan, Designer Skin, and Swedish Beauty. There's many different packages to choose from. Six-session package or 30-day pass. Even single sessions. Sign up today in your membership and get $70 worth of product. They're located across from Masonville Mall in the Wendy's Plaza at 60 North Center Road, London, Ontario. Visit Eurosun Tanning today.